I live on the outskirts of a mid-sized town in Wyoming. The whole reason I live here is because owning a huge plot of land isn't as impossible of a task as it can be in most other states. My house is small, but it was cozy enough for living alone. This happened four years ago, in 2019. It was spring, and we were going through a month of pouring rain almost every single day. It was a Sunday, and I was home from work, spending the day watching TV and resting. Sometime around 6 or 7, I got an unexpected knock at my door. I barely heard it through the rain, and when I answered the door, I was even more surprised to see it was some random guy. Not a mailman or anything of the sorts. Someone coming all the way out onto my property without notice was very unusual, being that it was far out of the way. How can I help you? I said. The guy, looking somewhere in his late 20s, said he'd been camping out in the woods nearby and had gotten into some trouble and needed a place to stay for the night. With the location of my house, if he wasn't lying, then showing up at my doorstep would make sense because I was the closest place within the woods by at least five or six miles. It was also pouring out, which made me feel even worse for him, but it still didn't take away from the possible danger of letting a stranger into my home. I offered him a phone call to get a ride into town, but the guy denied my offer. After bluntly saying he couldn't stay here, the guy walked off. I watched him go down the dirt road a little ways, then he veered off and walked into the woods. As odd as that was, I didn't have it on my mind for more than a few minutes before I was back to watching TV. I didn't check the time very often, but it had to be at least two hours later and well into the night when I saw an orange glare coming from the window by my backyard. I got up and moved the curtain. Through the rain and fog, I saw a campfire right in the middle of the woods outside my house. It was small, flickering under a large tree as the rain poured down on it. Standing next to it, there was the outline of a figure holding something. I couldn't tell though if he was facing my house or into the woods. After a moment, I closed the curtains and picked up my phone, calling the police to let them know about this person outside my house. I knew it would take probably an hour for them to get here, and whoever was out there wasn't doing me any harm, but at the very least I wanted them away from my house before I went to bed. Once I got off the phone with the officer, I checked the window again. The fire was still burning lightly, but the figure wasn't there. Then I heard footsteps coming toward the house. I ran to the other window and caught sight of him walking past with a hunting rifle in his hand before he turned the corner and went to the front door. He banged on it a few times, then it went quiet. I grabbed my self-defense handgun from the hallway closet and hid around the wall, still trying to process the situation I was in. He hit the door again. This time I could tell it was with the stock of his rifle nearly breaking a panel out of the door. In this moment, I could only think that I had to try to deter him immediately before it becomes life or death for one of us. I shot around toward the edge of the doorframe, deafening myself for a second as the shot rang through the house. When my hearing came back, all I heard was the rain pouring down. No footsteps, banging, or yelling. I gathered up courage after five minutes of no sounds and looked out the peephole, seeing an empty porch and outside in the yard were clear footprints going away from the house. He must have run right after the shot during the couple seconds I couldn't hear. Police did a thorough search and found some strange details. Out by where the campfire was, they found a duffel bag with evidence of it having been buried nearby and likely dug up just hours before the attack. What they told me is that it was most likely a burglary kit, or possibly even a murder kit, that was planted in advance with the intent to be dug up and used later on. This means whoever attacked me had planned it and had been right outside my house at least once before that night. 
why he attacked me specifically is not known, and who and where he is currently is still no closer to being figured out than it was four years ago. I still live in the same house and worry every day that he might come back. I was 22 at the time and living in a very small one-bedroom house in the cheapest area of my city. After work on a Friday night, I hopped online to game with a bunch of my friends. It was the perfect night for staying up late, with heavy downpour outside and no work or school the next day. We played for probably two hours before a sudden sound had me put everything on pause for a minute. It was a thump sounding like it was upstairs. My initial concern was a possible leak in the roof caused by the rainfall, so I went up to look. The only rooms upstairs were the single bedroom and a half bathroom, and neither of them had any signs of leaks anywhere, so I ran back down and got back online with my friends. I was on for a while, only getting off at 2am because everyone else went to bed. I shut everything off and sat on the couch with some snacks while I watched YouTube on my phone. Ten minutes in, I heard another thump. It was from upstairs again, but it was so muffled that it almost sounded like it was on the roof or something. I did an even more thorough search of both my bedroom and the bathroom up there, but there wasn't anything showing itself to be the cause of the sound. I was sure it wasn't thunder either, because it vibrated through the walls like something literally hitting the house. After 10 minutes of looking around, I was so determined to figure it out that I put on my shoes and went out into the rain to see if there was something more noticeable from outside. At first I saw nothing of significance, but then I noticed a tree branch getting pretty close to the side of my house. It was a large and sturdy branch though that was a good three or four feet away from the siding, and even in the rain, it wasn't really swaying all that much. It seemed unlikely that it could reach the side and bang up against the side of the house. As I looked at it though, I realized there was a small window on the house that the tree kind of covered up. It was higher than my bedroom window, meaning it had to be an attic. I had no idea there was an attic at this house. The hatch was definitely nowhere noticeable, and the roof wasn't a steep slope, so it didn't look like there would even be room for one. This hidden window was the first clue I'd ever seen to indicate there being an attic. I went inside, even more curious than I was before, and started searching for this hatch that I had to have somewhere. It took a minute, but I found it inside my bedroom closet. It was small and perfectly smooth with the ceiling, basically blending in aside from the tiny gaps from where it opens. I stood up on a box and pulled it down, releasing a rusty ladder from the opening. Immediately, I was hit with a rotten smell, followed by another thump sound. From below, I could tell the attic was extremely short maybe two feet tall at most. I climbed up carefully and looked into this tiny space, basically a wide, dark tunnel, and at the end by the window, I could make out a figure, ducked down on all fours and looking straight at me. I almost fell off the ladder, trying to jump down and run away. I heard them shuffling around as I got my phone and left the house, calling 911 in my driveway. The cops got there and detained the man, who was just some homeless person. Apparently he climbed the tree up to the window and made his way in, staying up there for at least a week without me having noticed. The absurdity of it all was almost unbelievable. I moved out very soon after that, and every house since I've always checked the attics. But the one thing that has stayed with me is the image of that man at the end of the attic, on his hands and knees, staring at me with eyes resembling both fear and anger. In my mid-twenties, I worked at a retail store as the overnight manager. 
It wasn't a big place, and the only reason I was technically a manager was because I'd be the only overnight worker. So, I was in charge of checking stock, filling shelves, and sometimes receiving order shipments. I was very satisfied with the job and never found myself hating the work, and up until this, I hadn't had anything really happen. It was a weekday night, and a storm was just setting in as I started my shift. Over the first hour of being there, the rain had picked up, and the wind was hitting the building much harder than before, making a lot of noise. I was filling the shelves for the first two hours, trying to get the time-consuming tasks out of the way first. As I was in the aisle though, I heard a thud sound resonating through the building. It sounded like it came from the back of the store in the warehouse section, where our delivery bay was. I walked over and saw the solid metal back door that truck drivers used to get in when making deliveries. The more I thought about it, the more I convinced myself that the thud sounded like a bang at this door, as if a driver was trying to make a delivery, but there were none scheduled for tonight. I opened the door and was met with a face full of cold rain and wind. I stuck my head out briefly to look down at the shipping bay and saw no trucks, so I closed the door and dried off. While walking back to the aisle, I assumed the noise was just the building having shifted a bit from the wind, or maybe just some strange sounding thunder that I hadn't noticed before. I continued working for another full hour before taking a lunch break in the back office, spending maybe 15 minutes there before heading back. But while I was walking through the store, I got this strange feeling, like everything had gone silent aside from the rain ticking on the roof. It gave me chills, and as I reached the end of the aisle, I saw something that made my heart almost stop. Right next to my cart, halfway down, was a line of wet shoe prints through the aisle. I approached it without even thinking, and tried to figure out how this was even possible. I followed them down to the front of the store, until I saw so many watery prints going all over that it was impossible to follow and honestly, horrifying to know that they'd walked around the entire place. I ran back to the office and locked myself inside, calling the police and waiting. As I sat there, I only got more scared as I couldn't see outside the office door, and the rain pouring on the building was too loud for me to hear anything else. After 10 minutes, the operator that had me on hold came back on the phone and said the police were right outside the building. I quickly got up and opened the door, and right on the ground was another set of watery shoe prints alongside mine, leading right up to the office I was in. I sprinted to the front and hurried to let the police in. In their search, they didn't find anyone in the store. Security tapes were reviewed not long after, showing us a man in a dark jacket entering the building through a side door that had been left unlocked. He clearly spotted me early on and stayed hidden until I went on break, then he walked around aimlessly. He didn't steal or break anything, he just went down the aisles and looked at the shelves. But the creepiest and most horrifying part was when I entered the office and waited for the police. The man came up to and stood outside the office door, waiting for several minutes as he stared at the doorknob like he was preparing for me to come out. Luckily, he decided to walk away a few minutes later and exited the store. No more footage of him was seen after that. The man never came back, and as far as I was told, he was never found. What he was doing that night is still uncertain, and it will likely remain as an eerie uncertainty for the rest of my life. My parents had always been overprotective of me. I was their only child after all. I don't mind too much. I knew it was because they cared about me. Until I was 16, I'd never been left home alone at night. But finally, the time came. My parents left on a Thursday and wouldn't return until Saturday night. This was my chance to show them that I was responsible enough to look after myself. 
The first day was a breeze. Thursday was Netflix night, and summer break had me out with friends by Friday. That evening, my best friend Emma and I lounged on my bedroom balcony. It wasn't a mansion, but our house was spacious with a lovely view. As the 9 p.m. sky dimmed, we sat wrapped in blankets, sipping lemonade and laughing. <laughs> but suddenly, Emma's laughter stopped. She was staring at something across the street. I returned to my balcony and tidied up the blankets. That's when I smelled the cigarette smoke again. I paused, looked down onto the street, and there he was, the man from earlier. He was standing beneath a street light watching me. He finished his cigarette and threw the butt onto the floor, all without taking his eyes off me. The hairs on my arms stood up. What did this guy want? His tall stature, oversized dark jeans, lime green t-shirt, and nearly shaved head were unforgettable. He stood very still with his hands in his pockets and his eyes fixed on us. I felt pretty freaked out to be honest, but I didn't want Emma to know, so I lied. I said it was probably just a coincidence and the man was maybe waiting for a cab. Emma wasn't convinced. We sat for a minute longer in awkward silence, the dude still staring at us. I decided to break the tension and show Emma some TikToks I'd seen earlier. This made us feel a little bit better. And when we looked up from the phone, the man was gone. I felt relieved. There was nothing to worry about after all. Emma and I hung out for a bit longer, and then at 10 p.m., we headed downstairs as she wasn't staying over tonight because she had things to do the next morning. So her dad was driving by to pick her up. We went out onto the porch to wait. I didn't think much of it at the time, but there was this weird cigarette smoke in the air. None of my neighbors smoked, so it was pretty unusual. It's only now that I look back that I realized someone was nearby. Emma's dad arrived just after 10, and then I went back inside. I remembered how quiet the house seemed. This was my first time staying there overnight alone, so it just seemed eerily quiet to me. I returned to my balcony and tidied up the blankets. That's when I smelled the cigarette smoke again. I paused, looked down onto the street, and there he was, the man from earlier. He was standing beneath a street light watching me. He finished his cigarette and threw the butt onto the floor, all without taking his eyes off me. The hairs on my arms stood up. What did this guy want? I knew I should have turned away and gone back inside, but instead, I waved at him like an idiot. This must have excited him because he started swinging around and around the lamppost like he was in a musical movie or something. Then, as if he couldn't get any creepier, he started grinding and gyrating against the pole as if he was making love to it. This was too gross. I immediately turned and went into the house. I thought about calling my parents, but I didn't want to worry them. So instead, I went around the house checking that I locked all the windows and doors, and then I headed to bed. I woke up on Saturday morning and everything seemed ordinary outside. No sight of the man from last night. My parents were coming back home tomorrow, so I did a few chores and then went out with some friends. I got home around 9 p.m., and by 10, I was back on the balcony enjoying the stars coming out. The night was quiet. There wasn't much traffic where I lived. But then, the silence was interrupted by a giggle. Not a cute giggle of a child, but a gravely snicker. I peered over the edge of the balcony and was greeted by the smiling face of the man. This time, I didn't stay to watch him. I went back into the house and hid in my closet. I called Emma on my mobile and told her everything. She was extremely helpful, trying to calm me down while her dad called the police from his phone. Then, I heard this sound of smashing glass from downstairs. 
the man was in my house. I wanted to scream, but Emma helped me to stay quiet. Tears welled up in my eyes and spilled onto my cheeks. Emma, I whispered, if he gets in here, what will he do to me? Don't think about that now. Do you have anything you can use as a weapon? She asked. I had nothing. Suddenly, everything went quiet in my house. I held my breath. Maybe the man wouldn't find me. The silence seemed to go on forever, although it was probably only a couple minutes. Suddenly, the closet door was thrown open and I screamed. I dropped the phone and hid my face behind my eyes. I felt hands grab my wrists and pull me up. Terrified, I began to flail my arms, batting the man away. Natasha, stop, it's me. The voice was Emma's dad. He had come to rescue me. After calling the police, he jumped in his car and made his way there. I asked where the man was now and Emma's dad explained that he was locked in the garage. Emma's dad had entered the house through the same broken window as the man, and when the guy wandered into the garage, Emma's dad closed the door and locked him in. Sirens blared in the distance, getting closer. Moments later, the police arrived and made their arrest. Emma's dad let me stay with them until my parents got home the next night. I'm so grateful for them for everything that they did. There's no way I could have stayed alone in that house for another night. My name is Hannah. When I was 16 and living in Texas, I was obsessed with horror stories. I couldn't get enough of them. Horror movies, books, reading Reddit forums, and watching true crime on YouTube. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that one day I'd be the main character in my own true life horror story. The story I'm about to tell you unfolded on a summer's day in my hometown. My parents would go out to work and I'd hang at the house, enjoying my summer vacation. Sometimes I'd invite friends over or we'd go chill at the mall. Today though, everyone was busy or out of town with their family. I didn't mind spending the day alone. The air con in the house was better than the Texas heat anyway. It was approaching lunchtime and I was getting hungry, so I decided to order from DoorDash. My parents absolutely hated DoorDash and food ordering apps. They just read some weird story online about creeps delivering food, but like, who even believes those? Millions of people use DoorDash every day with no problem. So I get on the app and ordered from Chick-fil-A, my guilty pleasure. At this point, everything seemed normal. I placed the order and was notified, your driver Eddie is on his way. I don't really like answering the door to delivery guys, so I made a specific request to leave the food on the doorstep. If you've never used DoorDash before, let me tell you, that's a totally normal request. The food delivery person usually comes up to the door, leaves the food at the door, and then updates the app to say that the food has been delivered. Sometimes they might knock on the door or ring the doorbell, just to make sure that you know. But either way, it's a pretty normal thing to do. Eventually, I got a notification on my phone that Eddie was on his way, and then another saying that he was pulling into my street. Usually, this would mean I'd hear a soft thud of my food being dropped on the porch, and then my phone would beep to let me know that the delivery was made. But not today. I heard the car door open and close, footsteps as Eddie approached the house, and then nothing. Weird. How long does it take for this guy to drop off my food? I was upstairs in my room, so I went to the window and peeked out. I could see his car on the street, so I knew he hadn't left yet. I checked my phone. He definitely hadn't updated the app to say that the delivery was made, so I assumed he was still on my porch. And then I saw him. He walked back out onto the driveway and looked right up at my bedroom window. He was tall, scruffy, a bit unkempt looking, but there was something in his eyes that freaked me out. They were so dark, like he had no irises, 
just big black pupils. I quickly moved away from the window. Just hurry up, dude, and leave. Next, I heard three loud, slow knocks on the front door. What the actual f*** was going on? I stood in silence in my bedroom, afraid to move. Eddie knocked again, but this time louder, more forceful. I called down that he could just leave the food on the porch and I'd come get it. The knocking continued, louder, more forceful. This was when I realized he wasn't just knocking now. He was kicking the door. Was he trying to get in? I moved towards the top landing of my house where I had a good view of the door and called down again. Is there a problem with my order? You could just leave it on the doorstep. It's fine, really. I tried to keep my voice steady, but inside I was shaking. Hannah, came Eddie's voice. Let's not play games. Open the door. I don't know how else to explain it, but his voice wasn't like a normal human voice. It was the voice of a madman. The type of voice you heard in horror movies like Hannibal or The Shining. This dude was going to kill me, I just knew it. No sooner had the thought passed my mind when the door broke open. There, at the bottom of the stairs, stood Eddie, his tall figure silhouetted in the Texas sun. With Eddie in the house, my brain ceased to function and my body took over. I ran into the nearest room, my parents' bedroom, and barricaded myself in. Downstairs, I could hear the muffled sounds of Eddie ransacking the house. Then, nothing. I thought maybe he'd left. Maybe he'd just robbed the place, but, but then, the door handle to my parents' bedroom began to jiggle. Eddie's voice, eerily calm, sent shivers down my spine. Hannah, you didn't leave me a tip, but such a pretty young thing like you can surely find a way to pay me back. The horror of the situation truly hit me. This man was here to violate me. A surge of adrenaline pushed me into action. I pushed open my dad's closet where he keeps his golf clubs and hid myself beside the door. The next few seconds seemed to stretch into hours. Eddie managed to use a knife from the kitchen to jimmy open the door. As he stepped in, I swung the golf club with all my might, catching him off guard. There was the sound of something crunching, and then Eddie screamed, grabbing at the back of his head. Without wasting a second, I bolted from the room and ran to a neighbor across the street. Thank God they were home, and I was able to call 911. The cops arrived pretty quickly, but still, Eddie had vanished before they got there. The police took the matter very seriously, but I heard from my parents that DoorDash denied having an Eddie on file. It turns out they were lying to us, though, and lying to the police, because weeks later, we read a news article about a DoorDash delivery guy named Eddie who brutally attacked a group of teenage girls having a slumber party. That could have been me. Today, years later, I still deal with the trauma from that event. I'm scared to be home alone and decided to get a license to conceal and carry a weapon. I know that my story is rare. DoorDash is probably safe for the most part, but just remember, creeps and weirdos are out there. Always trust your instincts and be wary, especially when you're home alone. Not everyone is who they appear to be. This story takes place only last year. I was home from college for the summer, spending time with my friends and family. One evening, an old school friend, who was also back in town for summer, invited me to a party. It was the next town over, so I agreed to be the designated driver. There wasn't much going on in my town, so I was glad to have something to do. And if I'm honest, I was hoping for a summer fling. So I got dressed up in my cutest outfit. We arrived at the party a little later than everyone else, and it was in full swing. My friend knew a few people there, so she quickly disappeared. 
I didn't know anyone, and with my friend already off having fun, I just hung around the food table, nibbling on snacks. Eventually, this guy approached. He was not really my usual type, but still good looking. He started a conversation with me, and it was clear that he was into me. Perfect. My summer fling. Our conversation flowed effortlessly, spanning from our favorite movies to whimsical stories of childhood pets. By the night's end, we traded phone numbers, and in the following week, we texted almost non-stop. I felt like we had a really strong connection, and eventually, we met up and hung out a few times. That's when everything started to go wrong. What had seemed like a fun and casual connection took a darker turn. His messages flooded in non-stop, shifting from friendly banter to an uncomfortable clinginess. I tried to pull back, hoping he'd get the message, but he didn't. His barrage of messages took an aggressive tone, and though it had been just a fortnight since our first meeting, I felt the weight of his obsession. I couldn't let this go on. I felt kind of bad at first. Had I not been clear enough about this being a summer-only romance? I decided to confront him and be honest. I called him, hoping for an amicable resolution. When I told him I wasn't looking for anything serious and that maybe we should call it off, he started telling me how I was the love of his life. He said that no one had ever made him feel this way and that we were destined to be together. Dude, we only met two weeks ago. I tried to be as kind and understanding, explaining that I was going back to college in a few weeks and it wasn't possible to have a long distance relationship. This was the final breaking point for him. He erupted into anger, hurling insults, his voice chillingly morphing from sweet to sinister. I should have hung up the phone, but I just sat there and took the abuse. When I didn't say anything, he responded with the most chilling statement yet. I'll be seeing you soon. The line went dead. Panic set in. He knew I was alone this weekend, as my parents were out of town, but he didn't know their address. I'd always done the driving on our dates, so he had no idea where I actually lived other than the town name. But just to be safe, I locked all the doors and windows. When I felt safe enough, I headed to bed. My sleep was interrupted at 3.20 a.m. when my phone buzzed with a notification from my Ring app. The security footage revealed him lurking outside, an indistinct object in his hand. I watched through my phone as he stood on the small porch, staring unblinkingly at the front door. I don't know why, but I decided to talk to him through the ring camera. Really, I should have called the police and stayed silent, but I was so shocked to see him there, I, I wasn't thinking right. What are you doing here? I said. The guy turned to the ring camera. And that's when I saw it. The indistinct item in his hand was a knife. Startled by the camera, the guy turned and left, only looking back once to see if I was still watching him. I reported the incident to the police and handed over all my messages and ring camera footage to them. It turns out that by sharing so much personal information with this guy, he was able to log into my social media accounts. You know how they ask some weird information like your pet's first name or your mom's maiden name? Well, I told him everything that he needed to know. It felt disgusting to know that this relationship I was building had been exploited, and even more terrifying to know that this sharing could have gotten me killed. It's alarming how easily personal antidotes can be weaponized in our digital age. Guard your stories no matter how trivial they may seem. Enable two-factor authentication and be mindful of whom you share your life with. The nights still hold a tinge of fear for me. Please, let my experience be a lesson. Stay safe and vigilant.
I'm 32 and live alone in a rural house. I have a few neighbors half a mile down that I talk to sometimes, but I mostly keep to myself and only go into town when I need to. I'm half retired, so I spend most of my time at home, but a few months out of the year I do some contracting work. At the time it was late fall, and on this day I was getting all of my equipment from out in the yard and storing it in the shed to prepare for the winter season. It was just a bunch of tools and lawnmowers and stuff like that that I'd left out. Anyway, while I was outside, I saw something unusual. A man was walking along the road that connected to my driveway. He had nothing on him, no backpack or camping gear. For context, this road he was on was entirely empty aside from the few houses like mine, and the town was a four hour walk away. I watched him until he disappeared far off down the road. After he was gone, I looked down in both directions and saw no cars on the side of the road on either direction. It was really odd, but after a while I stopped thinking about it and finished up with my yard. I was back inside before dark and made dinner while I cooled off. As I sat there, a sudden thud from outside startled me up from the table. It was a wooden thump, like it had come from where the shed was. I looked through the window out into the yard, and the door to the shed was wide open. It was old, but the door had never unlatched on its own like that before. Still unsure of exactly what was going on, I knew I had to check on it and close the door at the very least. I got my rifle just in case, but I was confident it wasn't going to be anything dangerous. Walking out to the shed, I listened carefully and heard nothing other than the quietness of the night. I looked around the field as well and saw no signs of wildlife or people. When I got to the open shed door, I turned on my flashlight and shined it inside. Nothing looked out of place. I stepped in and did a more thorough search for any animals hiding, but still there wasn't anything. I closed the door to the shed and made sure it was secure, then started walking back. As I made my way through the field toward my house, an eerie feeling grew inside me. I didn't know what it was, but it continued to grow as I reached the front door. I stepped in and locked the door behind me. As I walked into the hallway, I saw a shoe print right on the floor. I flicked on the light, and going across the hallway was a line of dirty shoe prints leading up to the spare bedroom. My heart started beating faster as I held my rifle up and took a deep breath, then carefully walked up to the door. I leaned my head against the wood and listened, hearing what sounded like someone breathing right on the other side. Before I could even think on what to do next, the handle twisted from my grip and the door swung open. I jumped back and held the rifle up as a man looked like he was about to charge at me holding a huge metal shovel up. I think my gun stopped him in his tracks though. He stood in the doorway holding the shovel like a weapon and having a face full of rage. I yelled as loud as I could for him to stay back, trying to sound intimidating but I was undoubtedly terrified. The man kept his distance, but his face full of anger never faded. From this moment though, I didn't know what to do. Cops wouldn't be able to make it here for probably an hour if I called, and I definitely didn't want to hold him at gunpoint for that long, risking anything to happen. As we stood in a strange silence, the man suddenly threw the shovel in my direction, then sprinted back into the room. I ran in to see what he was doing and watched him start crawling out of the window. Part of me wanted to stop him, but another part of me couldn't get myself to. He jumped out and ran off into the field, escaping in the vast empty night with no way of knowing where he was running off to. To this day, that man has never been identified and his intentions are unknown. All I can say is that if I hadn't had my rifle in my hands, or if he had gotten the jump on me, I likely wouldn't be here today.
I was 18 at the time and it was the beginning of summer, so I was off from school and I didn't have any job. The majority of my time was spent inside the house playing video games, watching YouTube or TV, or just relaxing. When this happened, my parents were out of town for a few days, leaving me with the house. This was a common thing and was never a big deal. Sometimes I'd invite friends over or whatever, but this night I was just enjoying the time to myself. I was watching a rerun of one of my favorite shows on Netflix while also scrolling through my phone. It was late, I don't know the exact time, but I think maybe 11 or 12, when there was a knock at the front door. I paused the TV and went to see who it was. It almost didn't even register in my mind that it was so late, but thankfully it did before I carelessly would have opened the door. I looked in the peephole and saw two men, both wearing similar clothes and just waiting for me to answer. I stood there and thought for a second whether or not to let them know I was home by asking what they wanted. I ended up staying quiet and just watching to wait for them to leave, but a few seconds later, they called out. Hello? We're here looking to speak with Mr. and Mrs. Ian. That was my parents they were referring to, though I changed the name for privacy. Confused, I still remained quiet, knowing it was far too late for any sort of visit even if it was important. After a minute, the men looked at each other and said something quietly then walked off the porch. The outdoor lights were off, so I couldn't see where they went, but I never saw any headlights or cars show up, which had me wondering if they'd walked here, which would only make things weirder. I went back to the TV, but left it on pause for a while so I could hear if they came back. It only took a few minutes until I heard a pair of footsteps outside the house. They went up to the porch, but instead of knocking like they did before, they started making their way around to the side of the house. I got up and ran to the back window as they got to the backyard. I saw them open the fence and enter, and I hid away from the window so I wouldn't be seen, but I could hear them go up to the back door. They started talking, then began messing with the door. I took this as my chance to get my phone and hide inside the garage. I called the police explaining the possible break-in that was taking place, and after less than a minute, a loud pop sound vibrated through the house, and the back door slid open. Their footsteps went through the house and straight to the stairs, going up to the bedrooms. A door opened and they entered, then closed it behind them, but after that, there were no more sounds. I waited for a horrifying and slow 10 minutes in silence before the police pulled up to the house. When they did, there was a few quick footsteps upstairs, then the two men started arguing. A few officers came in through the back door and ran upstairs, while another came to the garage and helped me outside. The men didn't resist the rest, but they also didn't speak a word on why they were there. Despite weeks going by, and it being somewhat obvious that they weren't simply robbing the house, the only thing they could charge them with was breaking and entering. It scares me though that they seemed to be looking for my parents, and it almost felt like they were going to wait upstairs for them until they came back from their trip. I think back to whether or not I should have shown myself, and if that would have stopped the break-in, but something about their behavior tells me that they still would have broken in and would have done to me whatever was necessary. This was about three years ago. I was staying in a rental house while vacationing to see my brother. He lives six hours away from me, so I don't get to see him very often, and he only has a one-bedroom apartment, which makes me have to stay elsewhere when I do see him. The house I rented out was really close to my brother's apartment, and was the same price as nearby hotels, so it was an easy choice to go for the house. I had gotten into town early in the morning and met up with my brother for lunch, then got some groceries and was back at the rental around 5 o'clock. The place didn't have a lot to offer other than a couch, TV, and bed, but for the price, I wasn't expecting too much. 
I stayed up until 9, then got in bed. It had been a long day, so I was looking forward to getting a good amount of shut-eye. I laid in bed awake for longer than I wanted, falling asleep after an hour. When my eyes opened, the room was in full darkness, and I could sense that it was the middle of the night. Before I could even check the time though, I heard something outside the room. Footsteps slowly walking down the hallway, and then a door closing softly, followed by silence. It was like my whole body had frozen, laying in the bed still and staring through the dark room. After a minute passed of no more sounds, I got up and looked into the hallway. At the far end, I could see the front door, which I knew was the door I'd heard them close, but I didn't know if they were still in the house or if they had left. I quietly walked through the other rooms, not seeing anyone. Actually, the only sign of them having been here was the front door being unlocked. I didn't see any footprints or notice anything missing. After checking the locks on all the doors, I called 911. They came fairly quick, but didn't do much of anything. They said to make sure all the doors were locked and to contact the owner, but aside from their useless advice, they provided no intent to figure it out. I stayed up that night and waited until morning, unable to sleep. After calling the owner of the rental and discussing what had happened, I went to see my brother. While out, the owner let me know that he changed the pin code on the door, which did make me feel a lot better. I was out until late that day though, getting some dinner and drinks with my brother, and being dropped off at the rental sometime between 8 and 9. I went to the couch and sat down, feeling sleepy, but also feeling that nervousness again about the situation. Every time my eyes were about to close, my head would be filled with fear of the intruder coming back. Knowing I needed to sleep tonight, since I didn't get any last night, I decided to go through the house again and check the rooms in hopes to ease my mind. I walked around the living room and kitchen, then went down the hallway to the bedroom. I opened the closet and checked the attached bathroom, and just before I walked out, I heard footsteps running through the hallway toward the bedroom I was in. I swung around the corner and only caught a glimpse of a large man as he slammed the bedroom door shut. Then I heard his footsteps departing and going toward the living room while I stood in place and just listened. He went all around the living room and kitchen, staying inside the house for probably two minutes before I heard the front door open and close behind him. Police came quickly after I called again, and this time the homeowner came by as well. The living room and kitchen looked like they'd been ransacked. The furniture was scattered all over, and the cabinets were all open, with the things inside them having been tossed over the floor. After a closer look though, the owner didn't see anything that was missing. It looked more like whoever that man was, was looking for something very specific, and nothing more. I left the rental and got a hotel after that and within a few days, I was never updated again about anything. I assume he was never found, but the situation has left me with a lot of questions. Something that really gets to me is that I had checked the entire house that one night, so where was he hiding? How long had he been in the house with me? Was he watching me? And what would have happened if I had fallen asleep on the couch? I work from home for a cybersecurity company, which really isn't as interesting as it might sound. I have to be online overnight from 10 to 6, scrolling through files full of code to see if anything is a possible threat. It's extremely boring, and when paired with the overnight shift, it makes for a struggle every night to stay awake. One night, just a few weeks ago, I was up at 2am working and feeling the weight of my eyes. I pushed through the sleepiness for a while checking my phone over and over, hoping the time had somehow skipped forward. At 2.40 though, I took a break and decided to order some food to get myself some fuel for the remaining three hours of my shift. I opened up Uber Eats, and my only real option was Taco Bell, so I sent in an order and got up to get something to drink. 
As I walked through the house with only the hallway light on, I woke up some more and realized it was raining outside. I looked out the front window and was surprised at how hard the rain was coming down given I had been so oblivious to it while working. My first thought was how I just ordered for delivery and I felt really bad for basically making someone run through the rain for my own convenience. I checked my phone and saw the order was already received, so I sat on the couch and waited for them to show up. After about 10 minutes, I was notified that they had picked up the order, so I watched the map on Uber Eats as the car made their way across the town and eventually into my neighborhood. Once they were a minute away, I put my phone down and opened up the front door so we could make the exchange as quickly as possible. I stood at the open door, staring at the end of the road where they should have been coming from, but another five minutes went by without seeing any cars. I picked up my phone again and checked, but on the map, their car was still in my neighborhood, and when I zoomed in, I realized they were right around the corner, just before the turn onto my street. I looked outside again, but didn't see any lights from their car. My rightful reaction was that they probably had the wrong house, or couldn't see the address numbers through the rain, so I tried calling them. A few rings, then they rejected it. I tried again, but had no luck. Unsure of what exactly was going on, I stayed at the door and waited. I want to say five more minutes went by before I tried to contact them again. I called, and this time it rang for a while, but then they answered. I asked where they were and if they needed help finding my house, but as I listened for their response, all I heard from their side was the crackling sound of rain pouring down. After another few seconds, I hung up. Feeling really weird about that call, I checked the map one more time. At first, it hadn't updated, but when it did, it showed them right outside my house. I checked the windows and saw nothing, but knowing they were walking around in the rain like this was giving me a really bad gut feeling. I closed the door and locked it, and I swear I only made it a few steps down the hallway before a loud knock shook the front door. I carefully looked through the peephole. A man in a gray hoodie was pacing around on the porch. His head was on a swivel like he was checking for any onlookers as he waited anxiously for me to answer. Uber Eats delivery, he yelled, but nowhere did I see a bag with my food. I stayed in place, not answering or making any sounds. The man got increasingly more hectic with his movements and called out several more times. Then, he suddenly pressed himself up against the door, blocking my view as I heard a few dull scrapes on the wood before he quickly ran to the side of my house and disappeared in the rain. I called the cops, but his car was already gone, and from what I was told, he was using a scam account. A couple days went by with nothing else to report on until I noticed a small scratch on my front door. It was an X but it didn't look like it was made for me to see. It was more hidden, like a personal indicator for something. It could have just been a fluke to scare me, but I still painted over it to conceal whatever that marking was supposed to mean. That night still leaves me with an uneasy feeling in my gut, especially since he had some sort of sharp object in his hand as he waited for me to open the door. Part of me is still convinced that that won't be my last encounter with him. I was driving through my city, delivering for Postmates way back in the day when it had basically just started. Every order was mostly inside the main city blocks, but I had just gotten an order from outside the main roads. I picked up the food and headed over, but the further out I got from the city, the more the roads became less populated, both of cars and of houses. Everything was replaced by the woods. I'd been out this way before, but only when leaving town. I didn't even know there were houses out here. 
I drove until the GPS told me to turn down a gravel road, which was almost unnoticeable. There were no lights aside from the dim ones coming from my old car as I made my way down this thin path through the woods. It was much longer than I expected, taking a whole minute to reach the house. To be honest, it was what I assumed it would look like due to its isolated location in the woods. It was aged and almost entirely made of wood, having vines growing up the outside of the house. There were a few lights on inside, shining through the windows, but if there hadn't been, then I probably would have thought twice about approaching it. I checked the bag for everything, then went up to the front door. I pressed the doorbell, which didn't really work, so I had to knock as well. As soon as my hand hit the door though, it creaked open. Cautiously, I opened it a little further and called out. I have an order here from Postmates. A moment later, I called out again. Anybody home? There were no sounds coming from inside, but all of the lights I could see were on, and through the crack in the doorway, I could see a TV in the living room. It was playing, but was muted. I don't know how else to really explain my thoughts, but the vibes were just off, and I knew something was wrong about this. I turned and went back to my car, getting in and starting to do a U-turn. Right away, I felt a problem. The steering was stiff, and my car was struggling to move through the gravel, feeling extremely bumpy and jittery. I got out, and my face went cold when I saw that my front tire was flat. I then moved my eyes over to the other tires, and every one of them was flat as well. Not just a little deflated, but completely flattened. My stomach dropped, instantly knowing this was a purposeful act. In that moment, my mind was everywhere. What terrified me was that I didn't know whether someone put something on the path, or if someone had come up while I was at the house and done it behind my back. Either way, the only thing I knew was that someone was out here with me, way out in the woods, in the middle of nowhere. I got back inside my car and locked the doors, trying to call 911, but had no connection. As I ran through my few options, I saw a light in the house flicker, and the front door opened wider, revealing a man in the doorway. Without any hesitation, he started walking quickly over to my car. I didn't second guess myself this time, putting it in drive and forcing my car through the gravel. In the mirror, I saw the man stop and stare at my car. Once I was on the main road, I took it more carefully, driving slow to keep from damaging my car until I got enough signal to call 911. But what unfolded afterwards was equally as terrifying. That house was owned and lived in by a single mother with two kids, all of which said they were at the house sleeping in their rooms at the time I claimed this happened at. They never ordered anything, or saw any man, or even found anything missing in their home. I don't know if they were in on it somehow, or if they were just as much a victim as I was. Why the man ordered food to the house and slashed my tires still doesn't make sense to me though. The only thing I've thought of is that maybe he was planning to do something horrible to that family, and I was going to be set up somehow to take the fall for it due to my presence at the property at the exact time it would have been committed. It may be a stretch, but if that's true, then me getting away might have saved more lives than just my own. Being a delivery driver was never my first choice for a gig in my late 20s. But I got laid off during COVID, and the only place hiring was a local pizza shop. It was a popular place in our town, but really it was just basic pizza. Anyway, this was during the time when everyone was staying inside and ordering for delivery, so I was working overtime and staying busy up until close every night at 1am. This was just another day, running deliveries all over town. Around 12, we got a call in for four large pizzas for a house located just outside of town, about 30 minutes away. 
I accepted it, knowing it would be my last order anyway, and it was a big order, so the payment would likely make up for the longer drive. By 12.15, I got en route to the house. The drive wasn't anything to note. All the roads were empty and nobody was outside due to the mandatory lockdowns going on. When I got to the address though, I was immediately confused. There was a driveway with a large open gate, looking like it belonged to a large mansion of some kind, but at the end of the driveway was nothing. It was just a dead end with forest all around, except not far off in the trees was a glowing light. I pulled in and parked in the middle of the driveway and got out. Now standing outside, I could see more clearly that it was a campfire or bonfire of some kind, and I could hear a group of people talking. After a moment, a figure stepped in front of the glowing light from the fire and waved at me, like he was inviting me to bring over the pizzas. It goes without saying that this was not normal in any way, but seeing them wave me over and hearing the group of people gave me more than enough reason to believe it was just a bunch of college kids hanging out. I mean, they did order four large pizzas, so it all just added up in my head. I got the pizzas from the back seat and left the headlights on as I started walking off the driveway and into the trees. A few more people showed up in the light as I got closer, all watching me walk toward them. When I reached the bonfire, there was half a dozen more people standing and sitting in the area. Strangely, none of them seemed happy that the pizza was here, and there was nothing else around in the yard. No beer bottles or drinks of any kind. No music players, no games, just a bunch of people hanging around a bonfire. I stood on the edge of the site and kind of just held the pizzas up awkwardly, hoping one of them would come up to take them and pay. A second later, a man walked over and took the boxes, handing them off to someone else. The whole eerie feeling of this place was getting to me, making me more uncomfortable with every second that passed. Before I could even ask for payment though, I heard some footsteps approaching, and from the forest several more people came in toward the bonfire. There were at least a dozen of them now, all looking at me and not saying anything. I'd never once left without payment, but this situation literally had me shaking. I quickly turned around and started walking back to my car. I looked back a couple times, seeing them still standing by the fire and not hearing any of them speaking. As I exited the tree line though, my heart almost stopped as two figures sprinted away from behind my car. They went straight into the forest and disappeared past the headlights. I didn't even check my car for anything missing, I just got in and backed out, speeding down the road to get as far from there as possible. Once I made it back to the shop, I told my manager of the strange situation. Thankfully he understood and even tried calling the number they used to place the order, but they declined to answer. After a bit of discussion, I ended up calling the police to have them check up on the group's suspicious behavior. It had been less than an hour since I was there, but when the police arrived, the only sign of them was the bonfire still burning, but left unattended. What really happened that night is unknown, and as far as I can see, it will likely remain that way. I'm a female, and this happened a few years ago when I was in college. It was during finals week at the end of the school year. I had lots of studying to do to get ready for my final exams. There was a Starbucks between my apartment that I shared with my roommate and campus. I occasionally went there to study because I could focus better than at our apartment. Drinking some caffeine would also help me focus typically. One day I entered the Starbucks off campus later in the morning. Things were pretty quiet because it was after the morning rush. There were a few people on laptops and stuff, and I brought mine as well as some school notes and books. I sat down at a table, got my stuff out, and then went up in order to drink. Then I got to work studying for some of my exams. Probably an hour or two later, I was still there and going strong. I was very focused and not really paying that much attention to my surroundings. That's when seemingly out of nowhere, a man approached. He was tall, sort of thin, and much older than I was at the time. 
He waved at me briefly as he stood there on the other side of the table I was at. He asked me what I was doing, and I told him that I was studying for my final exams. The man then asked if he could buy me a drink. I told him no thanks and smiled politely. Then I pointed to the drink that I already had. The guy said, you're finished though. I had in fact finished it, but the cup was not see-through, so I'm not sure how he knew that. I told him that I didn't want another one though, and I was good. The guy stood there for a few moments and then just kind of walked away. I looked back at my laptop, but then looked up again a few seconds later to see where he went. He sat down in the corner across from me, but a decent ways away. After sitting down, he immediately looked up in my direction and I looked back at my laptop. From then on, I looked up here and there and I caught the man staring at me several more times. Soon I decided to leave because it was causing me to not focus as well. I had a good amount of studying done though. I left and went back to my apartment. I didn't have any more classes for the day so I stayed at my place. My roommate got back later that night and I continued to do some more studying in my room. I had an exam the next morning and another one the following day. At about 10 p.m. I decided to go to bed. As I was getting ready, there was a knock on the front door of our apartment. I assumed it was probably somebody there for my roommate, possibly one of her friends. My roommate and I got along well, but I never knew all of her plans. I didn't think too much of it, until she came over to me and asked me if I had invited anybody over. I told her no, and she then said that some guy was standing outside of our door. We both went over to the kitchen, where the front door opened up to. I looked through the little hole to the hallway, and the same guy was standing there. I jumped back when I saw him. My roommate asked me who he was and I told her about earlier in the day. I had no idea how the man got our address. We did not answer the door. He knocked again several more times. In total, he stayed there for probably about 10 minutes and it felt like forever. Finally, he left. I went to bed and luckily the guy didn't come back that night. The following morning, I took one of my exams and returned home to study for the exam I had the next day. This time, when my roommate was gone and I was home by myself, at about 5 p.m., there was again a knocking on the front door. I walked over and looked to find the man there again. This time, he was more persistent. The way he knocked was louder than before and faster. It was like he knew that I was home and was frustrated that I wasn't answering. Then, he even tried opening up the door, which was locked. I was terrified. What if he tried breaking in or something? I called my roommate and told her that the guy was back. She was on her way home and I didn't want her to run into him. He stayed there standing outside the door but didn't knock again. He just stood there for a really long time. I kept watching, hoping that he would leave. After at least 10 more minutes, he finally did. I told my roommate that he was gone and soon after she got back home. But neither of us felt safe there. Luckily, we had some friends who had a college house not too far away and we ended up going there to spend the night. They had enough space for us, and we were both afraid that the man would return again. When we stayed at our friend's place, the guy didn't show up there. In fact, I only had to be at college for two more days, and I stayed at the same house the whole time. I just didn't want to go back to our apartment. My parents then came up during the day to help me move out of the apartment. I'm sure that the man probably returned, but at least he didn't break in. I still don't know how he knew where we lived though. He must have followed me back, which really creeps me out, but I had no idea. I'm just happy that I haven't seen the guy since. I used to work at a Starbucks coffee shop a few years ago. I only worked there for a couple of months. One night, it was approaching closing time, and I was working with one other coworker. I don't remember exactly when we closed, but I think it was like 8 or 9 p.m. There was one other customer inside who had been there for a while. He was sitting at a table, working on his laptop and drinking a coffee. We let him know that we would be closing soon, and he assured us that he would be out by then. The Starbucks location that I worked at was a little quieter. It wasn't located right immediately next to anything else and was kind of by itself. There was no strip mall or other stores right there, but there were a couple of miles down the road. When we had five minutes before we closed, suddenly somebody appeared at one of the front windows. It was a man wearing a creepy looking alien mask. I was the first to see him and I made a comment to my coworker who also saw the guy. We laughed at first and assumed it was someone just being silly. Still, I'm not going to lie, I had a sort of bad feeling. The guy then banged on the window a few times really loudly. The 
the way that he pounded on it was so loud, I was almost surprised that the glass didn't break. It no longer seemed like a completely harmless joke. The man inside on his laptop now looked over and made a comment like, What the heck is that? The man outside then pressed his face and hands right up against the window and stared in at us. He was pretty far to my left, and I was fairly close to the entrance doors. I walked over and said that I was going to lock the doors now, because we were closing in three minutes and I didn't know what this guy was up to. Then I walked over and did so. The man in the alien mask remained where he was and kept looking inside. I heard my coworker and the customer talking to each other a bit. They were wondering what the guy outside wanted and who he was. We also didn't know exactly where he came from because we could see just about the whole parking lot from the windows. The only cars there were my coworkers, the customers, and mine. After I locked the doors, I went back over to behind the counter with my coworker. We all watched the man as he kept looking in for about another minute or so. Then, he walked over to the doors and tried entering, except the doors were now locked. He then banged on them a few times. I walked over and yelled at the guy that we were closed and I asked him what he wanted. He didn't respond, but remained standing there blocking the doors. The customer inside the store had now packed up his laptop. Then he said, I know you guys are closed now, but I'm not leaving with that guy standing there. We told him it was okay, and we weren't going to leave either until the guy in the alien mask moved. All we could do was wait. About five more minutes went by. Now this was getting ridiculous. I decided to walk over to the door and yell out to the guy again. This time, I asked him to leave. But as soon as I started walking over, the man began to pound loudly on the door. I said that we would have to call the police if he didn't leave. I really didn't want to, but I didn't know how else to get him out of there. When I moved away from the door, he finally stopped banging on it. Then he went back to his stance, oppressing his face and hands against the glass window. We all just kind of watched him and waited it out. Probably five minutes later, when I was strongly considering calling the police, he finally left. All of a sudden, he just stood up and walked off. We were all more than happy to see this. The customer then left as well, followed by my coworker and me. We looked around the parking lot and property, but didn't see the guy anywhere. None of us knew exactly where he had come from. Soon, all of us got to our cars. The customer and my coworker were pretty quick to leave. However, I took a little bit of extra time because I was texting my mom about what had just happened before I drove home. All of a sudden though, I looked up and the same guy was standing about 10 feet away and approaching my vehicle. I wasted no time and I got out of there as fast as I could. He actually sprinted after me, chasing me to the end of the parking lot. Luckily, he never caught me and I got away. I never saw the man again. I still wondered though what his intentions were. Was he just some prankster that took things a little bit too far or would he have harmed us? I'm glad I didn't have to find out though. I went to Starbucks last month and had the worst experience there of my life. The thing is, I've gone there probably a hundred times before. I'm a big coffee drinker and I have coffee every day before work and throughout the workday as well. I don't stop at Starbucks every day though. Sometimes I make coffee at home. Other times I go to different coffee places. It just depends on a lot of things. This time though, I was going to Starbucks. As I pulled into the parking lot, the line for the drive through was extremely long. Because of this, I decided to walk inside, thinking maybe it would be faster. However, when I got inside, I noticed at least 10 people were there. There was a line of about three or four to order, and the rest were waiting to pick up the drinks that they had already ordered. The employees all seemed very busy, constantly making drinks and taking orders for both the customers inside and the drive through line. At this time in the morning, I imagine that it's always busy like that. I had made my decision though, so I stuck to it and got in the back of the line. As I was waiting in line, a couple of people came inside and got behind me. A few minutes went by and soon it was my turn and I ordered. Then I made my way to the people who were waiting for their drinks. There was probably four or five other people there when I got there. Soon, one of the drinks was done and one of the people picked it up and left. I waited there for about three or four minutes as other people periodically got their drinks. I figured that mine had to be the next one because now everybody else who was around me waiting had ordered theirs after me. There were still about five of us there. I was actually getting a little bit concerned because I really needed to be getting to work. I didn't expect it to take this long to get my drink. 
Finally, one of the Starbucks employees put a drink down and said my name. I should mention that my name is Jessica, and the drink was clearly what I had ordered, the same size and everything. I started to walk over to get the drink, but a woman cut in front of me immediately. She had just ordered and wasn't even right behind me in the line. There's no way that this was her drink. I was in sort of disbelief as I watched her pick up the drink and start to walk out. I followed her and stopped her just before the exit. I told her that I thought that was my drink. She turned to me and had a really angry look on her face and told me no, it was hers. I told her that my name was Jessica and I had ordered before her and this was exactly what I had ordered as well. The woman claimed that her name was Jessica and she was in a big hurry. I asked her what it was that she ordered because I didn't believe her. She just said, this, as she held out the drink to me. She didn't even say the name of it, which made me doubt her even more. Then she started to walk out. I didn't want to go and ask for them to make me another drink and tell them the situation. The employees seemed far too busy to even notice, and I didn't want to be late for work. I told the woman, fine, take it then, and I walked out behind her and headed for my car. I would just make a pot of coffee later when I got to work. It really wasn't that big of a deal. Still, the fact that this woman had cut in front of me taken my drink and been so rude about it made me angry. To my surprise though, when I arrived at my vehicle, the woman who took my drink was now right behind me. She said to me, how dare I accuse her of stealing my drink? She went on to say that she hadn't stolen a thing in her life. I told the woman that I had to leave and I didn't have time to argue with her. She started to say more to me, but I ignored it and just got inside of my car. I shut the door as she continued talking. When this happened, the woman then said, here, take your stupid drink. She then removed the lid and dumped the whole thing on my windshield. I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. Before I could say anything though, the woman was storming off in the other direction. All I could do was turn on my windshield wipers and then drive off. The whole experience really blew my mind at how rude some people can be. I got to the end of the parking lot to merge back onto the road. It was busy and I had to wait for a little while. During that time, I saw a car drive right up and slam on its brakes right behind me and then start honking. I could see that the same woman was behind the wheel. I really didn't know what her problem was. When I finally merged onto the road, she went right behind me and proceeded to follow my car at an extremely close distance, even honking at me a few times. This went on for several miles before finally, she swerved around me, flipping me off in the process. She then sped away and out of my sight. I got to work and made coffee there, although I didn't even need it. Even though the woman stole my coffee, the confrontation really woke me up for the day. I didn't go back to that Starbucks for a while, but I have been back since. I haven't seen that woman, but hopefully she doesn't do something like that again to anybody else. I currently work at Starbucks and have worked there for nearly a year. I'm a part-time employee and work all kinds of hours that were open. The Starbucks location that I work at, I would describe as an average location. It's near a shopping area with some other stores and restaurants nearby. This is a story of something that scared me a lot, and it happened several months ago. On this day in particular, I was working a closing shift, and when I started, I think it was about 12. We closed at 8pm, so it was an 8 hour shift, and we generally were not too busy in the afternoon until about 4 or 5, then things would get kind of busy for a few hours. By 7, the place was usually very quiet again. I remember that the first few hours on this day went by sort of slow, because things weren't very busy. Inside the Starbucks, there are quite a few tables that people often come in and work at on their laptops or read books. There were a few people that got coffee as they worked or studied. By 5 o'clock, things were busy. It was around that time that I first saw a man inside that was acting sort of strange. I remember that he had a full beard that was not incredibly long, but a decent length. He was balding and wore baggy clothes. The guy started walking around really quickly inside. It looked like he was walking fast to go someplace, but then he would just turn around and walk back. Soon, it seemed as though he was speed walking laps around the store. It was strange to say the least. After about a minute or so of that, he stopped, and it appeared as though he went to talk with someone that was sitting down. I had work to do, and I got sort of busy for the next little stretch of time. Probably 30 minutes or so later, I heard that some of the customers were complaining about the guy. I looked out and he was still there. Now he was sitting at a table by himself and just kind of looking around. 
Apparently, he had approached several customers, asking them to buy him something or give him their drinks. Because I was the least busy at the time, after talking with the coworker, I decided to ask the guy to leave. I was nervous to do so because I didn't know how the man would react. I walked out from behind the counter and towards where I had seen him. It was still pretty busy and people were all over the place. This Starbucks, I feel like, is a little bit larger than most. When I got over to where I had seen the guy sitting before, he was now gone. I looked around and walked through the entire place. I couldn't find him anywhere though. I guessed that he had left. This was actually a relief to me and I went back to behind the counter. I returned to work making drinks after that. By then, it was maybe between 6 and 7 p.m. Things quickly died down inside and got much quieter. A few of my coworkers left at 7 and there were just four of us working for the last hour. When I would work closing shifts, the 7 o'clock hour always seemed to drag on. It was very quiet typically at our location, plus usually it had been a long day to that point. We didn't get a whole lot of customers either. Finally, 8 o'clock came. Nobody else was inside at any of the tables. I walked out to clean the floor like one of us always did at closing time. When I got over to the back area where the bathrooms were though, I noticed that the door was closed to one of them. We had two bathrooms right across from each other in this small little back hallway area. They were both single room bathrooms with a locking door. When nobody was inside of them, they would be open. I remember the man and instantly my heart sank. Could he possibly be in there? It was like I just knew. Still, I knocked on the door, but I got no response. I waited for a bit and then knocked again. This time, I said that we were closing and I asked if anybody was inside. I got no response then as well. I started to think that possibly somebody had just closed the door and then left. I knocked again and asked if anybody was inside and I listened closely. I was listening for any kind of movement or indication of somebody being in there, but I heard absolutely nothing. I took a couple of steps back and then, out of nowhere, the door burst open. Sure enough, the man from before came running out, and he was running right towards me. All I could do was run away from him. My coworkers heard the commotion and saw me running. I ran all the way out of the building though. When I made it outside, the man was probably about 10 feet behind me, and he followed me out. I sprinted through the parking lot and didn't know exactly where I was going. I couldn't get inside my car on time before the man would reach me, so instead, I ran through the parking lot to another one where there was like a grocery store. I ran all the way to the grocery store and went inside of it. Thankfully, they were still open. At some point, the man stopped chasing me, but I honestly don't know when. All I know is when I got inside the grocery store, I didn't see him anymore. One of my coworkers was calling me on my cell phone and I answered. She asked me if I was okay and also mentioned that they had called the police. I said that I was fine, but I didn't know where the man was anymore. Very carefully, I walked back to Starbucks. As I did, I kept an eye out for the man, but I didn't see him. When I made it back, there was a police car outside. We all talked with officers, and they said they would search around the area for the man. We finished up our work, then all left. It made for the scariest day I ever had working there. This happened my freshman year of college. I went to a pretty big university. And over time, I met a decent amount of people and had a few groups of friends that I would hang out with. By the time Halloween rolled around my freshman year, I had plans to go out with some of my friends. I dressed up as a nerd and we went out to a few of the bars around campus. As it got later, a few of my friends wanted to go to one of the bars in town that was pretty strict. Being 19 at the time, I figured I wouldn't get in. I told them they should go ahead and I snapchatted a few of my other friends asking what they were doing. One of my friends named John told me about a party he had been invited to. He said it was supposed to be really big and asked if I wanted to go with. To me, this was perfect because I wasn't tired yet and still wanted to hang out with people. I told him I'd go and I walked to the edge of campus and met up with him. We then walked a few blocks to where the address was that John told me. We saw what appeared to be the house. We could just barely hear the music coming from inside and saw a kid wearing a basketball jersey and sunglasses sitting out front drinking a beer. We walked up and John greeted the kid who I guess knew him. He introduced me and the kid said his name was Jake. Then we both walked inside the house and the first thing we noticed was a little entryway filled with shoes. We took off ours and then we went through another doorway into a room where we saw a speaker blaring music but nobody was in the room. 
Immediately, I got a bad feeling. And as I started to walk forward to the next room, I heard footsteps coming from behind us. John and I turned around and saw two large men enter the room with baseball bats. They had on ski masks over their faces, so I couldn't tell anything about them, but they appeared to be well over six feet tall. One of the men shouted that they would hurt us unless we did what they said. Then they ordered us to go into the next room that appeared to be at the back end of the house. I was terrified and John looked stunned and pretty scared as well. The next room appeared to be the kitchen. There was a little table with a chair there, and it also had a stove and a sink, then the back door to the house. There was also a wooden door cracked open that led to the basement, which is where the two men told us to go. They stood about six feet behind us with their bats in their right hand and their left hands pointing. As we were walking towards the door, John nudged me, and just as I looked at him, he suddenly darted for the back kitchen door, which I saw him pull the lock back and open it all in the blink of an eye. Without even really thinking, I followed him and ran as quick as I could to the door. I had a strong rush of adrenaline as I did, and I heard the men behind us start to yell and run after us. I literally rammed into John as he ran out the door, and I almost tripped over him. As I was almost out the door, I could hear the men getting closer and felt the back of my right leg get hit with probably a baseball bat. It got me in my upper right calf and it hurt really bad, but the adrenaline kept me going out the door and I followed John around the side of the house. The longer we ran, the more my leg throbbed, but we seemed to get a little bit farther away from the men who were behind us, and as we passed by two garbage cans that were on the side of the house, I pushed one of them over to try to slow the men down. John started yelling as he ran, and by the time we reached the street, we didn't notice the men chasing us anymore. I ran with John all the way back to campus before I basically collapsed from being tired and the pain from my leg. We called the police and then told them the address of the house and everything. Apparently by the time they showed up, nobody was there and the house was vacant at the time, but was owned by a guy who typically rented to students. I'm sure that John and I narrowly avoided something terrible that night, and I had a really sore leg for a few weeks, but other than that, I was fine. A few years back, when I was 10 years old, me and three of my friends all went trick-or-treating together. It was a yearly thing for us to all go together because we lived in the same neighborhood. I remember that I dressed up as a football player, my friends Jeremy and Lucas went as basketball players, and my friend John was a robot. We started early at about 5 p.m. near Jeremy's house. He lived on the edge of our neighborhood, so it was a good place to start. Then we would work our way back, block after block to the end. It was a very large neighborhood and had houses of all sizes. We would always get tons of candy every single year. We made our way through the neighborhood, stopping at my house for a few minutes to take a quick break, and then we kept going. We ended up finishing the neighborhood at about 8 p.m. We thought about calling it a night, but it wasn't really that late yet, so we decided to make the walk through the park nearby to another area that had more houses. These houses were more spread out and had a lot less other kids trick-or-treating. The first couple of houses gave us large amounts of candy, and then we knew that we made a good choice to come there. Then we came upon this one house that had a very long driveway. In fact, we almost didn't see the driveway and we walked right past it until Lucas pointed it out. It was a driveway surrounded by trees on the corner of the street. When we started to walk down it, we saw that it went downhill quite a bit and then turned. We figured not many kids had been to this house and maybe they'd give us the rest of the candy or something, so we walked down the long driveway. When we reached the house, we saw a small light on the front step and a zombie decoration holding a sign. The sign said something like, To finish the prize, follow the zombies. And the fake zombie was pointing in the direction of another zombie that was next to the house in the yard. We walked to the second one, and it was pointing towards the garage which was behind the house. Me, Jeremy, and Lucas ran toward it to try to get all the candy first. There was another zombie pointing to behind the garage, and the final zombie outside that pointed to the door of the back of the garage. Looking back on it now, I see how sketchy it was, but we just really wanted the candy and didn't really care. The three of us opened the door to the garage and walked inside while we heard John walking behind us and laughing. 
When we got inside the garage, it was almost completely dark except for a small light coming from a desk chair with a zombie sitting in it holding a large bowl of candy. The three of us inside the garage had big smiles on our faces when we saw how much candy was in the bowl. We knew we could take almost all of it because of how late it was getting. We all walked to the candy, but as we did, we heard the garage door slam shut behind us. We turned, expecting to see John, but he wasn't there, and about one second later, the lights went completely out and all we saw was darkness. We were a little freaked out, but laughed it off as a prank and started taking the candy. Just then, I felt someone grab my arm. I could tell it wasn't one of my friends because of how strong the grip was and how big the hand felt. I started getting pulled away, so I shouted, stop. My friends started asking me what was going on. We heard John trying to enter the garage, but at that point it appeared to be locked because the doorknob just kept jiggling. I started screaming help, hoping my friends would be able to help me, but they just shouted back asking where I was. At this point, whoever was there put their other hand on my other arm and was basically leading me slowly deeper into the garage. John then started pounding on the door. After about five seconds of John pounding on the door, I was suddenly released from whoever was holding on to me and I heard a grown man's voice from the other side of the garage yell at us all to get out. The door was then unlocked and John opened it and just stood there while the rest of us dashed out as fast as we could. We ran all the way back up the driveway and back to my house. It was a terrifying experience and I really don't know what was going on inside that garage. We didn't report it or anything which was probably a mistake but my friends and I still talk about it all the time. In 2013, my best friend Lindsay and I went trick-or-treating together. I dressed up as Harley Quinn from Batman, and Lindsay was Minnie Mouse. We hung out at my house for a while, and we took some photos together, then we left. We planned on going to Lindsay's house after to hang out, because my parents were going to a Halloween party at their friend's house. We went trick-or-treating around the neighborhood which had a decent number of kids out. I remember seeing somebody dressed up in a full skeleton costume complete with a mask walking down the street passing us. He went the other direction and waved at us. We waved back and kept going. About 20 minutes later at a house, I saw the same skeleton guy behind us walking up the driveway. I thought it was a little strange but we kept going. We stayed out maybe another hour trick or treating and the skeleton guy seemed to be behind us the entire time. We didn't think much of it still, until we decided to call it a night and head back to Lindsay's house to hang out. When we started walking back, the skeleton guy started walking back too. By this time, there wasn't many other trick-or-treaters out at all, so we were a little concerned of who this guy was. He seemed pretty big, and we thought he was maybe in high school or something. We walked all the way back to Lindsay's house, which took us half an hour, and the guy trailed us about 50 feet behind the entire way. The longer he followed us, the more creeped out we became, and I kept telling myself it was just a coincidence. At last, we finally reached Lindsay's house and went inside. Her parents were home, and we felt a lot safer. We stayed at the window to make sure he went out of sight. Then we told Lindsay's parents about it, but they assured us it was just a coincidence and he probably lived down the street. Me and Lindsay went up to her room then and forgot all about the man. We watched a scary movie and had some candy. Then it got pretty late. It was a Thursday night and a school night, so I decided to head back home. My house was only about a five minute walk away, so I left and began walking down the street. I was kind of spooked from the movie and it being Halloween night, and not long into the walk, I started hearing footsteps from the other side of the road. I looked behind me, but I didn't see anything. I kept walking until I started hearing the footsteps again, and they seemed to be getting closer. I turned around and saw the skeleton man about 40 feet away on the other side of the road. At this point, I was very close to my house, so I made a run for it and sprinted down the street through a neighbor's backyard and into my own backyard. Then I unlocked the back door and went inside. The whole time I didn't look behind me and I didn't want to know if I had been chased or not. When I got inside, I was disappointed to see that my parents still weren't home yet, so I was home alone. I went around to make sure that all of the doors were locked to make me feel safer. 
As I was at the front of my house, I heard somebody at the back door of my house trying to open it. I just about had a heart attack and I knew it was the skeleton man. I slowly walked to the corner and looked around it to the back door. As soon as I did, I made direct eye contact with the guy. I ran back around the corner. As soon as I did, I saw he was looking right at me. I ran back around the corner to the living room and grabbed the phone to call the police. The guy kept trying the doorknob the entire time. The lady on the line told me the police should arrive within five minutes. This made me feel a little better, but I was still terrified. I ran upstairs to my bedroom and locked the door. Then I called my parents. I told them what was going on and they told me they were on their way home. I just sat in my room waiting for the police to arrive. I was starting to feel a little better until I heard movement downstairs from inside the house. My heart dropped. I knew it would only be a matter of time before he came upstairs. I ran to my closet and hid inside of it. Then I plugged my ears and closed my eyes. I waited for what felt like forever until I heard loud shouting coming from down the hall. I uncovered one ear to see who was shouting and when I heard multiple voices, I knew it was the police. I slowly left my closet and went to my door and cracked it open. There was the man in the skeleton costume being held by police in my hallway about 20 feet away. His mask was off his face now and it revealed that he was at least 30 years old if I had to guess. They took him away and started asking me questions. My parents arrived back about five minutes later. It made for a really late night and my parents let me stay home from school the next day. That was by far the scariest Halloween for me. A couple of years back, me and my friend Sam went trick-or-treating together. I think we were probably about 12 or 13 at the time. Sam's older brother drove us to the neighborhood that was a couple of miles away because our neighborhood was small and apparently this one gave the most candy. We got out of Sam's brother's car and he told us he would pick us up when we were done. We started going house to house and getting candy. I had never been to that neighborhood before, but I had to admit it didn't disappoint. People were very nice and we stayed there for almost two hours until we reached the end. There were a few more houses on a quieter road a ways down, so we decided to finish with those. Most of the houses there looked a little more run down and many had their lights off indicating that we shouldn't go there. Then we reached the house on the end of that street. It had its lights off, but the front door appeared to be open. We were literally turning around and starting to walk back when we saw a man peek his head out from inside the house and waved us over. We started walking to the man. This house was pretty run down as well and had a decent sized yard with long grass and some trees and bushes scattered around the yard. We walked up the driveway and down a sidewalk up to the front porch. Just as we were starting to walk up the steps to the house, I heard a bush that was about 10 feet away start to move. I looked over to it and saw a tall man walking towards us. When I looked at him, he had a terrible look to his face that just really gave me the creeps. He wore dirty clothes, had a scruffy beard and messy hair. At this same time, the man emerged from the house and started walking towards us. Sam took off running and I did the same. The men ran after us, but only for a short distance. We were easily able to outrun them. We sprinted all the way back to the first neighborhood where Sam called his brother and he came and picked us up. We told Sam's brother what had happened and he insisted that it was just a Halloween prank to scare us and then he wanted to drive us back to the house. We begged him not to, but he insisted and assured us that it was fine. I guessed that maybe it could have been a prank, but judging by the look on that man's face, I really didn't think it was. We directed Sam's brother back to the house and he pulled up on the street across from it a few minutes later. He told us to wait there and he would go talk to the man, then he walked up the driveway to the house. We watched from the car as Sam's brother knocked on the door. Then we saw Sam's brother slowly open the door and walk inside. Less than a minute later, we saw him sprint out of the house and back to the car. He got in and drove us right back, telling us that we were right. When we got back to Sam's house, his brother finally told us that when he got to the front door and knocked on it, he noticed it wasn't shut all the way, 
So he looked inside and saw that the house was completely empty. He said it was very run down and appeared to be vacant for quite some time. He had stepped inside to look around and then heard footsteps coming from around the corner, so he took off running. We never trick-or-treated there again. Years ago, when I was a kid, I used to go trick-or-treating with my friend Michael every Halloween. Afterwards, we would hang out and eat our candy that we got while watching scary movies. On this one year, Michael and I went trick-or-treating around my neighborhood, which was pretty big, and afterwards we got back to my house. Then we put on a movie, and the plan was for Michael to spend the night. Shortly after we got home, my mom, who was the only other person home, said she was going to bed. It was only 9 p.m., but she had work early the next morning. We were watching a scary movie in the living room after that and got probably about 30 minutes into it when I heard a knock coming from the front door. It really startled me because of the fact that we were watching a scary film. Then I remembered how it was Halloween and I stopped being scared because I figured it was just a trick-or-treater, so I started to walk towards the door. But as I got closer, I remembered how late it was, almost 10 p.m., and there weren't really people trick-or-treating out this late. I decided to just take a look out of the window first to see who it was. I peeked out from behind the blinds and saw a creepy looking man standing at the front door. He looked pretty tall and was skinny with a little beard. He also had sunglasses on, but didn't appear to be in any kind of costume. I had a bad feeling about it, so I decided not to answer the door and Michael, who was still on the couch, asked me who it was. I told him a creepy looking dude was there and I wasn't answering. I watched as the man looked around for a little while and then finally walked away. I was really happy to see him go because as a 12 year old kid I got scared pretty easy. I went back and resumed the movie, but I would say just about 10 minutes later we heard a knock coming from the door once again. We ignored it until they knocked again at a louder volume. I wanted to call my mom, but I knew she was sleeping and had to be up early for work, so I didn't. Michael and I both walked quietly over to the window this time and looked out. But as soon as we pulled the blinds back, we saw the man standing at our front step looking directly at us. I made eye contact with the man who had an angry look on his face. We quickly covered the window back up and ran away back to the living room. We were just hoping that the man would decide to go away, but instead we heard the knocking once again, but not at the door this time. Now it moved to the window where we had been looking out of. We couldn't see him from the blinds, but we knew that he was right on the other side. I was starting to freak out, but Michael said maybe it was just some guy trying to scare people on Halloween. I hoped that was the case, and the knocking from the man moved from one window to another. He seemed to be making his way around the house to the back. Then we didn't hear anything for a short time. All Michael and I could really do was sit there and listen. Then suddenly, we heard the loud sound of glass being broken. It sounded like it was coming from the back of the house at one of the basement windows. When we heard this, Michael and I both went running upstairs to my mom's room like five-year-olds. When we got upstairs, we woke her up and told her someone had just broken into the house. My mom got out her phone and called the police and also locked the door to her bedroom. Michael and I hid under her bed while we heard her talking on the phone to the police. Then we just had to wait for the police to arrive. We heard the man walking around downstairs but he never came up the stairs. Eventually, we stopped hearing him, and by the time the police showed up, he was gone. I picked up my first job this year as a delivery driver for Pizza Hut. I'm 16, so this was only a part-time job that I did after school a couple days a week. I chose Pizza Hut though because it's not that busy nowadays and I didn't want to have a job I was stressing out all the time at. The first months passed with nothing of interest. It was a very boring and repetitive job that left most days as forgettable, but then I had one experience that I'll never forget. It was a Friday and we got an order in just before closing. The address wasn't too far, but it went through a part of town that I almost never went to. This neighborhood was different from the rest, 
not having tons of houses or stores in it, which gave me no reason to ever go there. While driving through, I kept checking the GPS as it took me all the way through the neighborhood, turning down seemingly every road until it finally said I arrived, but something was off. On my left was a row of maybe six or seven houses, and on the right was a path leading to a park. The waypoint on the GPS was showing up on the right side, so I double checked by searching the address on Google, and it was the actual address of the park. I parked on the side of the road and picked up the pizza, getting out and walking up to the path. With a better look, I could see that it was just a walking path, not leading to any sort of playground or anything, which is where I expected to see a group of kids that had ordered a pizza. But instead, there was a guy sitting on a bench a little ways down, waving at me. I started walking over, still a bit unsure about it. As I got closer, he stood up and started sifting through his wallet for cash. The fact that he was alone on a walking path at night, and for some reason needed a pizza delivered here, was odd to say the least, so I was skeptical when I went up and greeted him. We began exchanging everything, but during the interaction, the guy started talking to himself, repeating the same phrases like, I'm okay, and everything's going to be okay which made me feel like I kind of needed to ask him if he was okay. He stopped talking and looked up at me. In his eyes, I saw fear and helplessness, something that I don't think I'd ever truly seen in someone's look before. From his look alone, a surge of adrenaline rushed through me and I turned around, only to be met by a tall man wearing a cloth mask over his face. He held me at knife point and screamed at me to empty my pockets and toss everything on the ground. I quickly did as he said and only became more terrified when he started to forcefully push both me and the guy from the bench off the path and into the woods, leaving everything on the ground and showing no interest in any of it. We walked for a few minutes, going well into the woods, far enough to no longer see the light of the path. Then the guy next to me suddenly shoved me to the ground and started to run in the other direction. The man in the mask surprisingly left me alone and took off after him. I quickly got back up and ran back to the path, hearing and seeing nothing else. Police arrived only a few minutes after I called, but both men were gone, and from what I know, they still are. I can't say why the other victim pushed me down, though it was most likely an effort to leave me behind so he could escape. I don't blame him, but it was a low move and makes me feel slightly less sorry for him and whatever he had to endure afterward. What the abductor intended to do is unknown, but him showing no interest in my wallet or belongings makes me feel it was something extremely awful. Ironically though, it was the selfishness of the other victim that both put me in that awful situation and saved me from it. I worked at a Papa John's in my town about two years ago while I was taking online classes in college. I don't think anybody actually wants to work at a Papa John's let alone any fast food place, but they were flexible with my availability due to having school on the weekdays. I worked three days a week, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all of which I did closing shifts as the delivery driver. I'm sure you all know the basic gist of it, but I pretty much waited in the store for orders to come in, then would deliver one or two at a time. Our location of Papa John's wasn't always that busy. I spent most of my time hanging out in the back and talking to my coworkers just waiting for the clock to run down. Just past 11, a call came in. My coworker answered it and put in the order, then quickly got it in the oven, and not long after, I was taking it out to deliver. The address was a normal 10 minutes away, inside a neighborhood of mid-sized homes. I pulled up their driveway and quickly got the pizza, then walked up to the front door. I was about to ring the doorbell until I noticed a sheet of paper taped to the door. 
On it was a handwritten message saying do not knock or use doorbell. I reread it multiple times over, thinking it must be telling me to do one or the other, but no, it said to not do either. It was a brand new piece of paper too, so I knew the sign had to be for me, but what was I supposed to do? I pulled out my phone and called the number on the order. It rang once, then I heard a ringtone coming from inside the house. It was quiet and muffled, probably coming from the back of the house somewhere, but after only a few rings, it stopped. I looked down at my phone and the call had been denied. Strangely though, I didn't hear anyone or see any movement in the windows. I leaned in closer to the door to try to listen more intently. It was quiet, no sounds at all, until suddenly chaotic footsteps loudly sprinted down the stairs, shaking the entire house and running straight to the front door. I backed away and tried to act natural, but the sudden aggression of sound had me a bit startled. A few seconds passed without them opening the door, but I knew the person was right on the other side. Assuming he was looking at me through the peephole, I got a bit more unnerved. I don't know if it was everything going on, or just a gut instinct, but something told me that this was wrong. Looking around the other houses, the whole neighborhood was dark with only a handful of lights on throughout the whole street, giving my feelings more sense to them. Then the door swung open. I have your pizza here from Papa John's, I said. The man gave me an empty look, then took the box from my hands. Immediately after, a loud thump resonated through the hallway inside the house. I looked past the man, but the house was too dark to see much of anything, and only a moment later, the door was slammed in my face. I heard him lock it, then quickly run down the hallway, and then it was silent again. I waited for a minute and listened, but after hearing no further sounds, I went back to my car and drove away. I parked in a nearby store parking lot and called the police to do a wellness check on that house. I wasn't sure of anything, but I didn't want to risk not reporting it. I got a call later that night, saying they didn't find anything to worry about. Strangely, they said only the man lived there but someone else had to have been there to make that sound I heard, which was also where I heard the phone ringing from. Nothing more came of it, but I still think on what exactly happened that night. It could have just been a strange man and nothing more, but it's the possibility of it being something else that keeps me up at night. I was driving a long route to deliver the last pizza for the night. It was well into the early morning hours, sometime around 2am. I live in a pretty small town, working for a local pizza shop that was one of the only places offering delivery given that most of the town is spread far out. The road I was on was a not so often used side road that conveniently went from one side of the town to the other without any stoplights or intersections. It was mainly empty, going through the forest that surrounded our town. As I drove along, something with my car started to feel different. I checked my gas, but it was at half, and no other icons were showing up on my dashboard. I figured it was nothing and ignored it, but the further down the road I got, the more my car began to struggle. It was bumpy, shifting back and forth as I tried to maintain speed, until it just stopped accelerating. The car rolled forward and I slowly turned it off to the side of the road, stopping it halfway in the grass. With some annoyance, I looked again at my dashboard as I tried to turn the car back on, but had no luck. I rubbed my eyes with frustration, then calmly got out and looked for any signs of damage on the outside of the car. I didn't see anything, but it was a really old car, and honestly I didn't even know what to look for. As I was out there, I looked down the road, not seeing anything but fog and trees, but when I looked back the way I came from, I saw a figure far out standing in the fog on the other side of the road. 
I got back in my car and called up one of my co-workers, who was also a friend of mine, and asked if he could do me a favor and pick me up. He agreed, though it wouldn't be for another 30 minutes. I thanked him, then called the customer to let them know my situation and apologized for the inconvenience. They were nice about it, so all I was left to do was sit back and wait. After a second, I remembered that figure that I'd seen, so I checked my mirrors, but saw nothing. I didn't see anybody on the side of the road or by the trees, although it was really dark and foggy. I sat back again and opened the box of pizza, grabbing a slice for myself while I waited. Over time though, an eerie feeling continued to grow on me. Being out on this empty road with very limited vision just started to freak me out. I could only see a few feet into the forest before it was complete darkness, and the fog on the road seemed to only get more dense as time went on. I waited for 30 minutes, keeping my eyes open the whole time and checking the mirrors, but then I heard something. Footsteps, getting more noticeable as the sound came closer, coming from the darkness within the forest. I stared at the empty fog, seeing a man appear near one of the trees. He walked directly up to my car, knocking on the window and sending a friendly smile at me. Uh, sorry, I can't roll the window down, I said through the glass, not really sure what else to say. The man said nothing, but then casually tried to open the door before walking around to the back. I looked in the mirror as he stood by the trunk seeming like he was trying to hide for a second as he shifted around with something in his hands. And it was just then that headlights came through the fog from down the road. The man watched as the car slowed down and started to pull in behind me. Then he ran into the forest, losing my sight in the fog. My friend seemed to have noticed the man as well because he was very cautious about approaching my car. We ended up leaving my car behind and it was on the ride back with my friend that he told me the man was holding a gun before he ran into the forest. We called the police and had a tow truck pick up the car, which happened to have been broken into and looted. It turned out that the gas meter was stuck in the middle, and it was actually an empty tank, but concerning the man, there's been nothing on it. I don't know what he was trying to do. I mean, he obviously robbed the car, but what would he have done to me if he had tried to while I was inside? And why was he out there on that empty road in the middle of the night anyway? All I can say is that if my friend hadn't shown up when he did, I'm pretty sure I would have never been seen again. Last year was the first time that I'd ever lived completely alone in a house as I had just rented a small place in a new neighborhood that was closer to my work. I moved in in early October, but it seemed like most of the neighbors kept to themselves, so I did as well. But everything was pretty normal otherwise for the first few weeks. Anyways, it was Halloween now, and I noticed only a couple houses actually had decorations up. They didn't have anything crazy, just a few pumpkins or signs, but it was more than any of the other houses. I decided to put up a small trick-or-treat sign on my door, and I bought a small bag of candies to hand out. Where I used to live, I'd buy three or four big bags, but I didn't get the feeling that these people really celebrated Halloween here, so I figured one bag would be enough. The afternoon came, and I got a few small groups of kids, but that was pretty much it. I was a little bit disappointed, as I always found Halloween to be enjoyable, even if I was just the one handing out treats at my house. Anyways, it started getting late, around 10 p.m., so I put the bag of candy in my pantry and sat on the couch to watch a scary movie to end the night on. I think I was halfway through the movie before I heard the doorbell ring. A little bit confused and annoyed, I got up and looked out the peephole to see who was there. I saw what looked like a small boy, maybe 10 or 11, standing at the door in a homemade costume. It didn't look like anything specific, just black cloth with red accents and a black mask. I opened the door, and he said trick or treat. 
By now, it was almost 11, so I was a little worried that he was alone walking door to door. I smiled and told him to wait a minute while I get him some of the candy that I'd put away. I went back to my pantry and grabbed a big handful and then brought them back to the door and dropped them in the boy's pillowcase. Then I looked around behind him to see if his parents were on the sidewalk or maybe a group of friends, but I didn't see anyone. He turned around and started walking away, but I stayed in the doorway for a few seconds just to make sure he was okay. But again, I didn't see anything or anyone, so I closed the door and went back to the couch. A couple more minutes went by before the doorbell rang again. This time, I went to the pantry first and got the bag of candy and then headed for the door. When I opened it, I was surprised to see the same kid standing there, but without a pillowcase or a bag this time. Concerned, I asked him if he was okay, to which he didn't reply. I looked around behind him again, but this time I noticed someone standing in my neighbor's driveway across the street, watching us. It looked like a full-grown man, but he was wearing a similar costume to the kids. Is that your dad over there? I asked nicely. The kid waited a second, and then said yes. Then I asked him why he came back to my house, to which the boy responded asking for more candy. I was even more confused by this, because he didn't have his pillowcase, but I held out my bag of candy for him to take out of, but the boy looked almost annoyed for some reason, then reluctantly reaches in and grabs a single piece before running off. That whole interaction creeped me out a bit, so I made sure to lock my door, and then I went back and finished the movie. It was pretty late at this point, so I decided to get ready for bed. I got up from the couch and began walking over to the stairs, but out of the corner of my eye I saw a light flash from outside one of my windows. I nervously went over and looked outside, and then realized that it was the motion sensor lights that were by my garage. I stayed in the window, looking around for a few minutes as I was getting pretty creeped out now, but nothing else happened, so I closed the blinds and headed upstairs to my bedroom. I laid in bed for probably 30 minutes, thinking about that boy from earlier and how strange the whole thing was. But as I started to drift into sleep, I heard a soft ruffling noise followed by loud thumping bangs on my front door. I shot up and jumped out of bed, then quietly made my way downstairs and over to the front door. Just before I looked into the peephole, three more loud bangs shook the door and made me jump back a little. I waited there for a few seconds, then looked. It was the man that I'd seen across the street from earlier that the kid had said was his dad. He was standing there, just inches away from the door, still wearing that creepy black and red costume and a mask. I could tell something was in his hand, but he was too close to the door for me to see what it was. There was no way I was opening that door, as I had no idea what this guy could possibly want from me. I knew this was either some sick joke or something much worse. I ran back upstairs and grabbed my phone, then locked myself in the room and called 911. The man continued banging on the door for probably a whole minute before it went silent. I waited in fear, hoping he had left for good. Then I got up and looked out of my bedroom window, which had a small view of the sidewalk that led to the front door. But as I was looking, the sudden sound of glass shattering came from what sounded like the kitchen downstairs. I was completely terrified at this point, with no way to defend myself if they came upstairs. Thankfully, just moments later I could hear police sirens down the road, followed by footsteps rushing outside from downstairs. I waited for the police to call for me at the front door before I made my way downstairs to let them in. They searched the house to make sure the man was gone and noticed a broken window in my kitchen where it was obvious the man had entered. I ended up staying at a hotel for the next few days just to be safe, but I guess the guy never came back. I run through the whole night in my head a lot, wondering if he was just using his kid as some weird way to gain entry into my house. I don't really know for sure, but nothing was stolen though, which makes me question what the man was really trying to do breaking in my house. Anyways, it's been almost a year now, 
and Halloween is in just a couple of weeks, and I'm starting to get pretty paranoid that the man from last year might come back to finish what he started. My friends and I were trick-or-treating a few years ago when we were 13 to 14 years old. This was our second year going without any of our parents coming with us, so we were pretty excited to run around the neighborhood collecting candy and just having a good time. Something we'd do every year before Halloween was plan out our trick-or-treating route so that we could go to all the biggest houses in hopes to get full-sized candy bars. Earlier this year, a whole street of newly built luxury homes were finally finished and people had moved in. So we decided to start there and then make our way around to the other neighborhoods afterwards. This new street of houses wasn't too far from my place, so we all met at my house on Halloween evening. Then we headed out to begin trick-or-treating. We stopped at a few houses on the way just for some extra candy, and then turned down the sidewalk that led to the new streets. To our surprise, we didn't see any other kids walking around here. We figured we were the first ones, and we got really excited and ran over to the first house. A kind older man opened the door and gave us each a full-sized Hershey's chocolate bar. Once we were out of the driveway, we all got super excited as we were already off to a good start. But as we rang the next doorbell, nobody answered, and neither did the next house or the one after that. One thing about this street was that each house had a really big yard, so the walk between them would take almost two to three minutes. After about ten houses not answering, we were starting to feel like we were wasting our Halloween here and not getting anything. We could see the next house though, and it was the biggest one on the street as far as we could see, so we agreed to try there first. This house had a really long driveway and led to an even larger circle driveway. As we were walking up, I saw a woman looking at us from the small window right next to the door, but as soon as I made eye contact with her, she quickly backed away. I figured she was just waiting for trick-or-treaters, and I was just glad to see that someone was home and hopefully had some candy for us. We got up onto the porch, and I rang the doorbell. Almost immediately, a woman opens the door, and standing behind her was another older woman, the same one that I'd seen in the window. They both smile as we say trick or treat. Then she opens the door wider, revealing a huge round table set up inside of their large entrance room. On the table was pretty much every kind of candy you could find at a store. I couldn't believe someone would spend this much on Halloween candy, but with a house like this, I guess it made sense. She told us to come in and choose two of whichever candy we wanted. Without hesitating, we all ran in and over to the table to look at everything they had. All of us in that moment were so happy, getting to decide on pretty much whatever candy we wanted. But as I was trying to decide on what my second choice would be, I heard the door slam shut. All of us turned and looked at the woman standing right by the door, still smiling at us. She then asks us to stay here for just a minute as she'd forgotten to put out some dessert for us to have on our way out, and then she walked away quickly. I looked around, noticing the other woman wasn't there anymore either. I could tell all of us were panicking and scared. Only seconds later, footsteps started coming towards us from down the hall. I immediately ran for the door and opened it, letting all of us outside as we could hear the woman call out for us to wait. We all ran down the driveway and didn't stop until we got all the way back to my house. We sat on my driveway, terrified and confused as to what just happened. We thought about telling my parents, but we knew they'd yell at us for stupidly going into the house when we were told so many times before to not go into anyone's home, so we didn't say anything. After a little bit, we ended up continuing our trick-or-treating in my neighborhood being a lot more cautious and trying to make sure we weren't the only kids walking around. It was definitely the weirdest thing to happen to me on Halloween, and my friends and I still talk every Halloween about what we think those women were trying to do, and what would have happened if we stayed in their house for the dessert. When I was a kid, I lived with my parents in a small neighborhood. Halloween was never really a big thing as far as trick-or-treating and stuff, so we'd always do something else. 
One thing my dad and I always loved doing on Halloween was exploring creepy or abandoned places together. It's funny, I would never do this kind of thing alone or even with friends, but with him I felt safe and I was never scared of what we might find, at least up until this day. After driving around for a while, we found a worn down barn. This thing had to be vacant for years, the siding was half gone and the roof was caved in. If it wasn't for the little slivers of paint here and there, you would have never known it was red. We maneuvered around broken glass and slabs of wood, finding left behind tools and garbage, and then I saw it. A cute little scarecrow perched up on the side of the barn. I pointed to it and my dad led the way, but the closer we got, the worse it started to smell. Poor guy, I heard my dad say as I looked down. It was a big wild raccoon laying motionless not too far from the scarecrow's feet. What do you think killed it? I asked. He examined it for a bit as I looked back up towards the figure, but then I froze. It was staring right at me. I could have sworn it was looking straight off into the distance before, but now its eyes have shifted onto me, still smiling and sitting upright, but just the eyes had moved. Dad? He didn't respond. I looked over at him, and he pointed at the raccoon with a more disgusted look this time. Then I saw what he was looking at. All of its insides were missing, and usually there would be a big mess or something, but the strange part about this was that it was hardly noticeable unless you looked closely. I didn't want to, but I looked up at the scarecrow once more. My stomach sank as I realized it was still staring at me, but its eyebrows that were once raised were now furrowed, and its smile was gone. Then I started to notice the scattered blood stains seeping through its raggedy clothes. I felt a sickness come over me, and I got really dizzy, until my dad put his hand on my shoulder. Probably just a coyote, he said, then started leading the way out. His words made me feel better but I wasn't too sure if I believed it. As we walked away, I looked back at the scarecrow, and it was just how we found it, looking off into the distance and smiling with its eyebrows high. I never told my dad, as I wasn't quite sure if what I saw was real or not, and I didn't want him to worry that I was seeing things and not take me on adventures anymore. I still had no idea what I was seeing, or if it was even real at all. But what creeped me out the most was that my dad went back a few days later to sketch the barn with my brother, and when he came back he showed me the pictures, but on them was no scarecrow. This happened back when I was a kid. I think I was 12 years old at the time, and it was about 20 years ago now. Halloween was one of my favorite holidays. I loved getting to hang out with my friends, put on some funny costume, and then go out and get a bunch of candy. This particular year, I remember that my friend Sean was coming over, and he was going trick-or-treating with me. Afterwards, he was going to sleep over at my house. I lived with just my mom and older sister, who was at her best friend's house. Sean and I left to go trick-or-treating at probably 5 p.m. I would describe the neighborhood that I lived in as pretty typical. There were quite a few other houses on my street, and we lived in a large residential area. My street itself was usually pretty quiet though, but we would still get lots of neighborhood kids trick-or-treating. Sean and I first went to all the houses on my street, and then we went to the next street over. We ended up spending hours trick-or-treating until our bags couldn't hold any more candy. I would say it was about 8 o'clock when we decided to head back to my house. During the entire time that we had been trick-or-treating, everything seemed pretty normal. We saw a bunch of other kids out trick-or-treating as well. It took maybe 30 minutes or so to walk back home, but eventually we got there. After getting back inside, Sean and I started going through all of the candy that we got. I remember that not long after, my mom went up to go to bed. Sean and I didn't have school the next day, so we were going to stay up late. 
we went into the living room and started playing video games. Probably PlayStation 2 or whatever was big back then. There were a lot of fun multiplayer games that we played, and we could do that for hours. But only like 10 minutes into it, the doorbell rang. Of course, Sean and I both assumed that it was a trick-or-treater, but it was pretty late for one. Plus, my mom had turned out the front light before going to bed. We looked at the time, and it was a little after 10 o'clock. This was definitely late for somebody to be trick-or-treating, but it was still a strong possibility. We paused the game, and I got up to check who it was. Sean followed me, but we both stopped to look out the front window from the living room first. We could see out to the front step if we moved the curtains a little bit. When I did, I saw that there was a fully grown man standing there facing the front door. It was not a kid or a trick-or-treater. The man had no costume on of any kind, and I didn't recognize him as a neighbor or anybody that I knew either. After seeing him, we quickly closed the curtains to the window, fearing that the man might look over and see us. We weren't really sure what to do, but decided to just ignore this. We didn't know what the man wanted, but it seemed weird for him to be there. Obviously, I wasn't going to answer the door late at night to some weirdo. The guy rang the doorbell one more time. I was kind of hoping that my mom was still awake and would come downstairs, but she didn't. After the doorbell rang for the second time, things were quiet for a while after that. Sean and I assumed that the man must have left. I felt a little bit better, and we were about to go back to playing video games, but Sean had the idea to check out the window to make sure that the guy was now gone. I agreed and walked over to the window. I pulled back the curtain to look out, but when I did, I saw the man was right there on the other side of the window. He looked right at me as I saw him, and I quickly closed the curtains again. Sean and I both sprinted out of the room and upstairs to get away from there. We went into my bedroom and closed the door behind us. I was really scared, but I felt like we would be safe up there. We didn't know what the man was doing in our yard, or right next to the window, but I was hoping that he would just go away. Sean and I were talking to each other about what we had just seen, when suddenly, we heard the sound of glass breaking coming from downstairs. When I heard this, I got 100 times more scared than I already was. Sean and I both ran out of my bedroom and down the hall to my mom's bedroom. When we got inside, she woke up and I told her what was going on. There was a phone in her bedroom and she started to call the police. I went over and locked the bedroom door. Then we all went into the closet of the bedroom and got inside of it. We didn't hear any noises, but the guy was downstairs somewhere. It felt like forever as we waited for the police to arrive. I was just hoping that we wouldn't hear the sound of somebody walking down the hallway or the sound of somebody at the door. None of us had any idea who this guy was or why he was here. After waiting for probably 10 or 15 minutes, the police finally got there. They searched the house, but the guy had left. He had broken the front living room window right by where we had seen him. Several parts of the house downstairs had things messed up and a couple of items were stolen. We were mostly just happy that the guy was gone though. I'm not sure why he broke into the house. I was pretty scared for the rest of the night and thought that the guy might come back, but luckily he didn't. That was definitely my scariest Halloween memory. This story takes place years ago when I was a kid. For some context, it was probably about 2003 if I had to guess and I was about six or seven years old. Even though I was so young, I think I remember this night pretty well. I got really excited for Halloween when I was younger because I loved trick-or-treating and getting lots of candy. The whole day was always a fun time. I remember that year I was going trick-or-treating with my older sister, who was about 10. Our parents trusted us to go trick-or-treating around the neighborhood by ourselves, and they would stay back with my younger brother. He was very young and maybe like three years old. My parents would hand out candy and take care of him while we were gone. Our neighborhood had lots of houses in it, and they were all roughly the same sizes. At the end of the street, there was a park, and then more streets of houses past that. We were planning to go down our street, and then maybe two or three more of the closest other streets. We didn't want to go too far out, and our parents had also told us not to. I'm not sure what time we left to start, but the sun was just beginning to set, I was a race car driver for Halloween, and I don't remember what my sister was, but there were quite a few other kids out, and we saw some walking down the street as we were leaving. 
One by one, we went to the houses on our street. We knew some of the neighbors around nearby, and they all said hi to us. Soon, though, we got towards the end of the street where we didn't know the people as well. It was around this time when I remembered that a van drove past us. The street was generally pretty quiet, but it wasn't uncommon for cars to drive by. The only reason I remember the van is because it drove past us going the other way just like a minute later. When it drove past us, it was also going extremely slow. Our parents had always told us to be aware of slow driving cars. It was probably just somebody with kids who were trick or treating though. My sister and I went to the next street over where the van had come from. The street connected at the end, and we started at one side of the street and then went to all of the houses. Then we crossed to the other side, went to all of those houses, and then we wrapped around to the park. When we were almost done with that street, the van drove by us again for a third time. This time, my sister said something. It was still going very slowly, and my sister mentioned something about how we kept seeing this van. It certainly was a little bit strange. I remember that it was a tan conversion van, and I couldn't tell who was driving it or anything. As my sister and I were approaching the park at the end of our street, we saw the van once more. This time, it drove extremely slow and then stopped near us. We both looked at it, and the driver's window rolled down. There was a man driving it who had a grayish beard, glasses, and was wearing a baseball cap. He said hi to us and then held out his window a large bowl of candy. He said something like, Hey kids, come and get some candy. I remember he had a big smile on his face. Now, my sister and I were always told not to approach strangers, and obviously not to approach strange vehicles either. But being that it was Halloween and it looked like he was just passing out candy, this seemed different. I mean, you would never knock on all of your neighbors' doors at night, but on Halloween, that was okay. We stood there just staring at the guy for a moment, and he told us that it was all right and waved us over. He had been maybe 20 feet away from us, and there were no other kids nearby in the street. My sister started walking towards the guy, so I followed. When we reached his driver's door, he told us to take as much candy as we wanted. There were a bunch of mini fun-sized candy bars in the bowl, and we each took like two. I remember him telling us to take more, and he seemed super friendly. We each took some more, and then the guy told us that he actually had a lot more candy to give out. He said there was a bunch in the back of his van, and we were welcome to help ourselves. Then he pointed to the side door of the van. My sister and I both knew better. This was really weird, and although maybe he did have a bunch of candy back there, we didn't want to find out. I just shook my head, and my sister told the guy no thanks. He was pretty friendly still, and said that it was alright. My sister and I then turned and started walking through the park on the path that it had. The guy remained in his truck and did not immediately drive away. It looked like he was just watching us as we walked farther and farther away from him. I know that I felt a little bit creeped out by this. We walked through the park and eventually reached the next street over. Then we started going to the houses on that street one at a time. My sister and I got lots of candy on that street and our bags soon became full. We decided to head home and that's when we saw the van once more. We saw it enter the street from the other end. My sister pointed it out and we were pretty close to the park. As it approached, we actually started running to the park to get away from the van before the guy would see us. When we were able to get back on the path that led back to our street, we watched as the van drove by. It was still going extremely slow. My sister and I talked about it a little and how weird it seemed. I was really young, but I knew something was off, and my sister, I'm sure, knew more than I did. We walked pretty quickly back to our street, and then we just had to walk down it until we got to our house. In the time that we were walking down our street, we did not see the van at all. Finally, we made it home, and we got inside of our house. It was probably like 9 p.m. or so by then. When we got inside, we would start eating candy and watching TV or movies. Shortly after arriving home, though, I was in the living room and noticed something out the front window. The van was driving by again. I called for my sister, but she was in the kitchen with my parents. Then, the van actually stopped on the side of the road, right in front of our house. My heart started racing, and I yelled for my sister and my parents. A few seconds later, they came into the room and I showed them the van. My dad pulled back the blinds to look out the window, and when he did, the van began driving away. 
we told our parents how we kept seeing the van and the guy gave us some candy. I remember our parents talking to us about strangers and stuff, but it seemed as though the guy was finally gone for good now. It must have been a weekend or something, because I know that we were staying up late that night. For the next couple of hours, I was eating candy and hanging out. I was in the living room and my parents, I think, were in the kitchen. I was watching TV when I heard the sound of a car driving down the street outside. I raised the blinds a little and looked outside to the street. The van was back. I watched it to see if it would drive past again. It was moving very slowly like always. The van went a little bit past our house and then pulled over and stopped on the side of the street. This was really creepy. Then, the driver's door of the van opened and the man actually got out. When I saw this, I started yelling for my parents again. They came into the room and the guy was now walking into the front yard. I said that the guy was back and my dad walked over to the front door of our house. He opened it, but as he was opening the screen door to go outside, the guy turned around. He then started running back to his van, got inside, and then drove away. I couldn't believe that he had returned yet again. This time, my parents called the police. I remember they came out a short time later and talked to all of us. We reported the guy for being really suspicious. After that, we didn't see him for the rest of the night. I'm really glad that he didn't come back. I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, my sister and I possibly came very close to being abducted. We were never going to go into his van, but the fact that he wanted us to was very suspicious. I'm hoping that the guy wasn't actually harmful, but I don't know how else to explain his suspicious behavior. I'm a female, and this is something that happened several years ago when I was in college. It takes place on Halloween night, and I was at a new university. I was a junior, but had recently transferred from a different college, and this was my first year there. Because of this, I lived in the dorms. I was able to make some friends at college pretty quickly at my new school, and by Halloween, we had plans to hang out. There was a few Halloween parties going on at some friends' houses and things like that. I dressed up as a cowgirl and walked with my friend to another friend's house. They were having a costume party. This lasted until maybe 10 or 11 at night, and then the people left to go to some bars nearby. I went with some of my friends, but the story really starts when I left the bar. Obviously, with it being Halloween, just about everybody had a costume on of some sort. It was sometimes hard to tell who everybody was. Eventually, though, at one of the bars we were at, I got tired and wasn't feeling it anymore. I decided to go back and go to bed. But none of my friends wanted to leave yet. It was maybe a little past one o'clock in the morning. I didn't think it was a big deal that they didn't want to go, and I would go back by myself. The walk back to my dorm would only take like ten minutes, and it wasn't that cold out or anything. I left the bar and started heading back. There were a few people out on the sidewalk at first, but it got much quieter. I headed down one of the sidewalks back towards campus. That was only a couple of blocks. When I was almost at campus is when I saw the guy walking a ways back on the sidewalk behind me. He was dressed up as the Joker from Batman, but he was wearing a rubber mask instead of painting his face. I had remembered seeing him at one point in the bars. I didn't know who he was, but I figured that it was maybe another student. The guy was maybe a hundred feet behind me. As I walked home, he did the same route as me and remained behind me. I stopped paying attention to him though, but when I was back at campus and approaching my dorm, I noticed him again. This was a little bit odd, but he possibly lived in my dorm building. I remember I kept seeing him a ways back, just walking closer to me. He also appeared to be looking at me the entire time, but through the mask, I couldn't really tell. Eventually, I made it to my building and got inside. When I was in, I went to the elevator and up to my floor, which was the third floor. Then I walked to my room and got inside. I changed and then was about to go to the bathrooms down the hallway. When I did, I heard somebody was going to walk past my room from outside. Instead of just walking out of my room, I looked through my peephole to see who was there. I saw the guy dressed up as the Joker walking by. I thought this was kind of strange. He then stopped at my door, which was really weird. That's when I wondered to myself if he had followed me back. Still, maybe he just lived there. My floor was all female, so I knew he didn't live on this floor. He was standing around for a few seconds, and then he kind of started pacing a little bit. He didn't really go out of my view though. 
Then, at one point, he removed his Joker mask. This revealed that he was probably not a college student. The guy looked to be in his 40s, or maybe even 50s. He was short and heavy set. I had no clue what he was doing here. Then he put his mask back on. I went up to my door and tried opening it. Luckily, the door was locked. He stood there, right on the other side of the door from me. It was terrifying. Then, I heard somebody's door opening from down the hallway. The guy then turned and walked away to the left. When he was out of my sight for a while, I opened up my door and looked out into the hallway. I couldn't see him, and he must have left the floor. I went to bed a short time after that, and I don't believe the man ever returned, but it was really creepy to know that he likely followed me all the way from a bar into my dorm building. I'm a female and recently moved into a new apartment. It's not too far from where I previously lived, so I know the city well. I really like my place and live in a one-bedroom unit on the second floor of the building. When I first moved in, about three weeks ago now, I didn't have much furniture. Where I lived in the past, I had roommates who owned a lot of the bigger things, like couches, tables, and lamps. After getting into my apartment and bringing all of my things inside, I realized that I needed to go shopping for some furniture badly. Over the next few days, I looked at countless websites online. I knew what I wanted for most of the things and did get a couple online, but I found that there was a lot of good furniture at IKEA. The IKEA store was a little bit outside of the city and about 15 minutes from my apartment. So on Saturday morning, I got in my car and headed to IKEA for some basic furniture and decorations. I had been there a couple of times before and knew what to expect. The place is massive and you could easily spend hours in there. I probably got there at like 10 a.m. and sure enough was there for about two hours. I looked at so many different things and ended up getting a decent amount of furniture and objects. The time that I was there, the store started out relatively quiet but picked up as the day went on. When I was just about done, things were pretty busy. I saw a lot of different people when I finally left, loaded up my car and headed home. I was excited to get back and finally decorate my apartment. It took me a couple of trips to bring everything up, but once I was in, I started the job of building a few pieces of furniture. I furnished my apartment for most of the day, taking breaks here and there. That night though, as I was hanging some artwork on the wall, there was a knock on my apartment door. I had no idea who it would be. It was like 10 p.m., so kind of late. I walked over to the door and looked through the little peephole, but nobody was there. This was strange because I hadn't really met any of my neighbors yet and none of my friends were coming to visit me or anything. I opened up my door and stepped out into the hallway to look around, however, I didn't see anyone. After that, I just went back inside and continued on what I was doing. I finally finished for the night about 10 minutes later, then I sat down on my couch and relaxed by watching something on TV but it was then that my cell phone started to ring. It was on the couch next to me and I felt it vibrating. I picked it up to see that there was a call coming in from an unknown number. I had a terrible feeling instantly. I didn't bother to answer it because I had no clue who it was, although I somehow felt like it was connected to the random knocking at my front door. Whoever called me did not leave a voicemail. For the rest of that night, they didn't call back whoever it was. I went to bed maybe an hour later. But that very same night, I woke up sometime at about 3 a.m. or so. At first, after waking up, I just rolled over to my other side and closed my eyes to go back to sleep. I was not wide awake or anything, still pretty sleepy. But that's when I thought I heard the sound of somebody trying to enter my apartment. It was the doorknob turning, but it didn't open because of the door being locked. After hearing that, I was now wide awake. I wasn't sure what to do, but I didn't hear any noise for a few minutes. I decided to get up and go investigate. Without turning any lights on, I quietly walked over to my front door. When I looked through the peephole this time, there was nobody there again. I did not go out into the hallway to look though. I was too scared to do that this time. I just walked back into my bedroom and attempted to go back to sleep, but it took me a little while. Eventually though, I did. A couple of more strange occurrences like this happened over the course of the next several days. None of them were as eventful as the first night, but two days later, I got another phone call from an unknown number late at night. Then, the very next night, there was just two knocks on my front door. 
It was a little bit earlier this time, at like 8 p.m. When I went over to look out, once again, nobody was there. The next night is when I started to figure out some things, though. I got another random knock on the door late at night. And when I looked through the people again, like always, I couldn't see anything. I just saw white when I looked through. I was very hesitant to open my door. I was afraid that somebody would be right there or something. So I decided not to go out. But about an hour later, I hadn't heard anything more that strange, so I decided to go out and look. When I opened up my door, no one was there in the hallway or anything. But I saw that somebody had taped a white envelope to my door right over the peephole. I grabbed it and then went inside. When I opened it up, there was a handwritten letter. It was very creepy to say the least. The letter seemed like it was from a sort of cryptic stalker. The person described how they had seen me the other day. They said they regretted not talking to me and asked if they had gotten my attention now. They also asked me why I hadn't answered their calls. I was beyond creeped out by this. But it doesn't end there. The next morning when I got up, I checked my phone. I had a text message from a new number. The texts were just a few pictures and videos. I saw the pictures appeared to be me when I was inside of Ikea. Most of them were zoomed in and taken from kind of far away. I had no idea that they had been taken either. There were a couple of short and shaky videos as well. They maybe lasted about five seconds or less each, and they showed me walking in Ikea. I realized now where this person had probably first seen me. After seeing these texts, I took some screenshots and then decided that I would go to the police. That very same day, I went and reported everything. I was told that they would look into it, and I'm really hoping that they find the person, whoever it is. That was not long ago at all. So far, the person has not been found yet, and I have no clue who it could be. The good news is that I haven't been bothered by them since. Nothing strange has happened at all. No random phone calls or texts. No knocks on my door or anything. I just hope it stays that way. I work at Ikea. I've worked there for a little bit over a year now. If you don't know what Ikea is, it's a very large furniture store, and there's also a cafeteria inside of it. The one that I work at opens at 10 a.m. and closes at 9 p.m. every day. I'm a part-time employee and have been one for the entire time that I've worked there. This is an experience that I had working there almost a year ago now, when I was still new to the job. I was working a later shift at night one time. When we closed, I was asked to go through the display store and make sure that nobody was still inside. Most of the employees still working were in the area where all of the actual furniture for sale is kept. The first part of the store is mostly all displays. It can be easy to get lost in all of the displays, and customers might not have realized that we were closed. But during the last bit of time that we were open that night, things had been pretty quiet, so I didn't think anybody would be there. I had done this a couple of times before too, and nobody had ever still been inside. I went through the first couple of areas and no one was there. Then I got to a bedroom display. For some reason, I decided to check under the bed. When I did, I was surprised to see a man hiding underneath it. His back was facing me, so I couldn't really tell what he looked like. I couldn't believe there was someone hiding there. I'm not sure at all how I even knew to look. I announced to him that we were closed and that he would have to leave. He didn't seem to move though. I didn't know the reason why he was hiding there. Possibly there was an explanation. Maybe he was playing hide and seek with his friends or something. I looked down at him again, but he seemed to now move farther underneath the bed like he was trying to hide from me still. I asked if everything was okay, but he didn't respond. I got a little bit worried now because I wasn't quite sure what to do. I was still new to the job, and obviously, I wasn't going to physically move the guy. I left that area to find another coworker and tell them about it. I made it a few sections away before I found someone. My coworker Jeff was walking by, and I told him that somebody was hiding underneath a bed in one of the display rooms. We both headed back over to the room, which only took about a minute. When we got there, the man was gone. We searched all around that room, and he just wasn't there. I hadn't seen him walking around the store at all, but I guessed that he must have left. Jeff had a walkie and radioed to an employee near the exit asking him if a man had left. When he was told no, we knew that the man must still be hiding someplace else. Jeff told a coworker by the exit doors to let him know if he saw the guy. I gave the general description of what he was wearing. Jeff and I then decided to split up and he searched one area and I searched another. We both searched the display rooms one by one. Jeff and I got pretty far apart from each other after only a few minutes. 
Maybe ten minutes after we started looking, I was by myself inside a living room display. That's when suddenly I saw the man again. He was now hiding behind a couch and stood up when he saw me. The guy was one of the creepiest people I have ever seen. His hair was messed up and he was missing some teeth and he gave me a really dirty look. I jumped back, wanting to just run away from him. I couldn't bring myself to say anything. As I moved back, the man actually took a step towards me before darting in another direction. After he had run away, I desperately tried to find Jeff or any other co-workers again. By now, the store had been closed for like 20 minutes and we just couldn't get this guy to leave. I found Jeff and told him about seeing the guy and him running away. We both went near the area and called out asking for him to leave and where he was at, but we didn't get any responses. We decided that we would have to call the police and we both headed towards the front of the store. That proved to be the right decision. The police got there a short time later and entered the store searching for the guy. It took them about 10 minutes, but he was eventually located. We saw them leave the store with the man and heard that when they found him, he had broken a lamp and was threatening to use it as a weapon against the officers. I'm really glad that he didn't try to harm me or Jeff when we were searching for him, but I really feel like he would have had we kept looking. I still work at the Ikea, and there have been a few interesting things to happen, but none come close to that crazy experience. I went to Ikea to do some furniture shopping a couple of months ago. Something really strange happened that day. I knew that I would be in Ikea for a while because the store is so big. Every time I go, it takes forever for me to find stuff. My friend was supposed to go with me, but canceled at the last minute. As disappointed as I was, I decided to just go by myself anyways. I still always enjoy going to Ikea. It has a kind of fun atmosphere in my opinion. When I went in there, it was kind of busy. I'm pretty sure it was a Friday if my memory is correct. There were people all over the store, which didn't make things go any faster for me. I didn't really need anything big but several small items. After being inside for more than 20 minutes, this one woman started following me. At least, that's what it seemed. I noticed her next to me, only like 3 or 4 feet away, but I thought nothing of it. When I moved away to go somewhere else, she did too. When I stopped to look at something, she stopped a little ways behind me. I thought this was weird because I didn't know who she was. I could tell that she was looking at me, and I looked over to see if she had something to say to me. But when I looked at her, she quickly looked away. I decided to move again at that point, and she followed me once more. I walked a decent ways away this time, and when I stopped to look at something, the woman also stopped. This time, I turned to her and asked her why she was following me. She looked away as soon as I looked at her again, and when I spoke, just walked away. She didn't acknowledge anything that I said, and before I had even finished speaking, she had walked around the corner and was out of my sight. I sighed and shook my head. At least she had finally left me alone. After that, I went back to my normal shopping. Luckily for me, I didn't see her for the rest of the time that I was shopping, which was probably about an hour. When I had got to the end of all of the displays, there was a cafeteria. I was pretty hungry and went inside to get a quick bite to eat. After sitting down at one of the many tables in the cafeteria, I saw the woman within about five minutes. She was sitting at the far other end and staring at me. She didn't have any food or anything with her. She wasn't with anybody either. I didn't know what her problem was. She was far away though, so I tried not to let it bother me. I wasn't going to get up and try to talk to her again either. I just went on my phone and enjoyed the great IKEA food. I did look up a while later and she was still there staring at me. This was just really weird and I didn't know why she was doing this. I did my best to not look at her and to forget about it. But only like five minutes later, I looked in her direction again. This time though, she was gone. I stayed there for a while longer and then I left the cafeteria area. I didn't see her at that point either. Then I was just about ready to leave. I went to go check out up at the front of the store. I bought a few things and then left to head out to my car. Like the store, the parking lot for Ikea is also very big. There were a lot of people when I got there, so I was parked kind of in the back. As I approached my vehicle, I saw somebody standing kind of in front of it. It was that same woman again. Now this was insane. She was just kind of standing there and not doing anything. I carefully approached, wondering why she was there. I didn't bother to try to talk to her or ask her what she was doing. She was maybe about five feet away from my car and to the right of it. 
I walked over to my driver's door, getting within maybe five feet of the woman. That's when she just started screaming like crazy. She was yelling and screaming, and I quickly got inside of my car. She didn't move and kept standing there until after I had gotten inside my car. Then she charged at my driver's window and began banging on it. She must have been on some kind of drugs or something. It was terrifying when she was pounding on the glass to my window, less than a foot away from my head. I started at my car and drove away from her. She was still standing there and yelling as I drove off. I was sure to call the police and let them know about what had happened. Looking back, I hope that the woman is alright and didn't hurt anybody either. I feel lucky that she didn't decide to attack me before I got in my car.